deputy minister is going to be with us for the first hour um, from what I've been told. Um, from the side of the members, Chair, um, present today is yourself, um, Honorable Dango, and Honorable Mashodi, Honorable Boshoff, and Honorable Lant. Um, Ms. Matavula did indicate that she's having network problems, but she will be joining um, as soon as um, she has connection. Um, in terms of apologies, we've got apologies from Honorable Moimang, Honorable Mamarahana, and Honorable, we've got a standing apology from Honorable Lansman. Um, in terms of my colleagues present, we've got um, my co-committee secretary, Ms. Denizulu. Um, we've got Advocate van der Merva, um, um, our procedural, um, NCOP procedural um, officer, Ms. Ali, and our committee assistant, Mr. Bazir. Um, I just admitted Ms. Matavula onto the platform as well. So she is now present. Oh. Thank you very much. I uh, uh, would also like to welcome all the uh, uh, honorable members. I don't know if you said that the deputy minister is uh, also in the meeting? Yes, she. Um, oh. Deputy Minister Gina is on the platform, and our um, content advisor, Mr. Sushuba, has also just joined us. All right. Now, uh, let me welcome the uh, deputy minister and uh, also all the honorable. I think also. Uh, Honorable Aplin, um, I see his hand is up. Maybe you also wanted to indicate that he's present. Over to you, Honorable uh, yes. Aplin. Yeah. yeah, good morning, Chair. Yes, Chair, I wanted to indicate that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Welcome. Um, let, I'm let me... also present, Chair. Oh, welcome, uh, Honorable And Martin. then welcome back, Chair. My apologies, we have a problem of not shading in case something goes wrong. Yes. No, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we understand. I'm also on load setting. I'm uh, hot spotting. Um, I think in terms of the program, we will uh, uh, ask uh, the DM uh, to make uh, opening remarks, and then we hand over to Advocate Van Meve to take us through uh, the responses to the submission made by the members of the public, uh, the stakeholders. And then after that, uh, uh, we head over to the department uh, to also tell us uh, the responses. Uh, welcome, uh, Honorable TM. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Let me also express our happiness to see you here live and, and handsome as you are today. Thank you very much. We also thank God for giving you this chance to come and be with us. Thank you very much for that. Let me greet the members of the portal committee, greet uh, the staff, the parliamentary staff, and also the officials that I'm coming with from the Department of uh, Trade, Industry, and Competition. Chair, we are happy really, and we are thankful for this opportunity that you are giving us. <clears throat> to come and, uh, 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 and present our very extensive work that we have been doing with regards to these two bills that we, are, well, that we have been seized with for quite some time now, Chairperson and Honorable Members. We are saying that the elongated time and the period that we have taken in working out <clears throat> the areas that were basis of this bill, uh, we have seen it being returned from the president. It justifies from that point of view an attempt that we have made in making sure that we ensure quality outcomes, which is a product of wide consultation by the role players in the sector. And indeed, that has been done. I just want to take this opportunity on behalf of the ministry and the department to extend our gratitude really to the public for the submissions and the submit, submissions of comments that have been given to us in the legislative, legislative process to ensure that the law is sound and it does respond to the creation of an enabling condu and conducive environment for the copyright-based industry. Again, thank you very much for that. We have made sure, Chair and Honorable Members, that all the sectors affected that includes people living with disability, the education sector, libraries, archives, mu museums, and technology sector, the art sector, advertising, music industry, film and television industry, t photographers, collecting societies, publishing industry, broadca broadcasting industry, authors, performers, 
have been recognized during this period. I might have left some other industries, but we really made, made, try to make sure that we cover everyone so that everyone might, must have a comment and something to say when it comes to these bills. These bills, Chairperson and Honorable Members, were not easy at all. They are very complex and they address several policy objectives, uh, addressing the diverse groups of co copyright-based uh, industries. We have seen, if I can just go through the memory lane just a little bit, Chair, we can remember that on the 5th of December 2018, the National Assembly adopted the bills. On the 28th of March 2019, the NCOP adopted the bills and they were referred to the President. On the 16th of June 2020, a letter was received from the President of the Republic to the Speaker of Parliament to refer the Copyright Amendment Bill and the Performance Protection Amendment Bill 2016 to the National Assembly for consideration of the President's reservation on the basis of, the, of their constitutionality. The president raised uh, some following constitutional reservation. First, it was the incorrect tagging, retrospective and arbitrary de uh, deprivation of property, impermissible delegation of legislative law to the minister, the issue of fair use, the copyright exception, international treaty implication. Some of these reservations that were raised by the presidency were procedural and others substantial in nature, and they have been deliberated extensively in Parliament, and I know as we are still going to be getting to the briefing, we are going to be touching on those. Uh, Section 79, uh, subsection 1, Honorable Chairperson of the Constitution of South Africa, of the Republic of South Africa, requires that the President must either assent to sign and sign the bill, or if the President has reservation about the constitutionality of the bill, he is able to refer that back to the National Assembly for reconsideration, and we have seen that happening. We have seen that the initial briefing by DTIC to the Portfolio Committee on Trade and Industry was in August 2020. It included a presentation on the trade implication. Part of it was delivered by the Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition. These bills were adopted by the National Assembly on the 1st of September 2022. They were referred to the NCOP for concurrence. Uh, the brief to the Select Committee on Trade, Industry and Competition, oh, it's not trade in that. It's trade, industry, economic development, small business development, tourism, employment, and labor took place on the 25th of October, 2022. The provincial briefing to the provincial legislatures took place in most of the provinces. And as we are talking now, the department is currently participating, participating in public hearings in some of the provinces. These provinces uh, include Gauteng, Pumalanga, Eastern Cape, KwaZulu Natal, Western Cape, Limpopo, and Northern Cape. Honorable members, <clears throat> we can see from the above that the journey that we have traveled with these two bills has been long. The departmental officials have worked on all the areas of concern and have clarified all matters raised by the sector, role players, and alignment to the Marrakesh Treaty. In this regard, then, I would really love to thank these officials uh, from the Consumer Corporate Regulation Branch and the CICP, parliamentary and provincial officials and leadership who are participating in providing support to the public hearings. The bills were recently advertised for public comment in the National Council of Provinces. The public hearings were held in the Select Committee, and we know the dates between February 21 to March 2023. Uh, today, really, we are here to make a very brief and open uh, presentation to you and to all the role players than those who are interested. And I will therefore chair after, as per the program that we are having right now, when you call upon us as the department, I will then le leave it to DDG Dr. Evelyn Masocha with his team. He's coming up with a very able team 
who will take through the select committee through all the proceedings through all the progress that has been made thus far so that we can take the discussions and the input from the select committee and we are always saying as the department we always treasure and value the comments that we get from the select committee because they help us to do our work even better so that is where we are today we are here to make that presentation and we are looking forward to the inputs and the discussions that we'll be getting from the portfolio from the select committee thank you very much uh, honorable chairperson and the members of the portfolio committee thank you very much uh, uh, mr Kina, uh, for the open remarks and also taking us through uh, where the the bills uh, uh, come from. Um, I also missed out on the uh, public hearings, uh, but uh, yesterday we had the management committee meeting. I've been uh, briefed uh, to where the process uh, uh, is now. Um, I will, uh, as I promised earlier, that we'll ask uh, then uh, advocate uh, uh, to take us through uh, the responses of uh, the uh, constitutional uh, legal uh, uh, office. Good morning, uh, Chairperson. Good morning to all the members. Good morning to my colleagues in the department as well as in Parliament. Um, okay, I want to, let me just see if I get the right screen to share. There we go. Okay. Um, don't see a green, yeah, I see a green thing. You should be seeing my presentation on your screen now. I apologize yes, for being away from you on the camera. It's just that uh, my presentation is on a different screen, but I'll try and see if I can, can look you in the eye, so to speak, every now and then. Um, it's something we lose from this online thing. It's got many benefits, but that eye contact is missing, but I'll try and make eye contact as much as I can. Um, so, okay, let me just see. There we go. Um, I want to just start off by just drawing a clear line about the role that the Constitutional Legal Services Office plays in assisting the committee. And I know it doesn't specifically now speak to the responses and so on, but you know, and, and in fact, we've now just heard this bill has come a very long, long way. Uh, you know, in, we, we started with this in uh, 2017 already. And I think some of the, the, the public have come to know my name um, and it, it, there, there has been some expectations put forward to the committee on what it is that I should be doing. And, and I only have a mandate that is limited. So I just want to explain that very quickly to, to members. So when, um, I'm sorry, there seems to be, oh, I now went ahead, I'm sorry. Um, so from, from our officer's side, we advise on what is before the committee. So in other words, the, whatever the policy position is that is proposed in the bill, that is what we advise on. We are not going to advise the committee on whether this policy direction or something else that is proposed by the public would be the best solution to, uh, to address the mischief that these bills are trying to address simply because that is not where we are experts. Our expertise lies in constitutionality, in legal questions, in drafting questions, interpretation, and those are the things that we will be advising uh, the committee on. So for instance, some of the things that were referred and, and then um, the legal advisor of parliament was requested to address those are technical matters. They deal with policy and um, therefore I, I, cannot, I cannot speak to that. Uh, for instance, whether the definition of audiovisual work should include cinematograph film. I cannot address that. That is something the department will address. What I can assure the committee and what I can assure, because I know the public is also following and, and presenters and, and people who made submission, because there's a lot of interest in this bill. What I can assure the committee um, and those who are listening is that all submissions have been, been, been considered by myself as well, but also by committee support staff. Um, we have, I have specifically looked at legal questions, but where there was a policy question that did not make sense to me or where I was concerned about what the correct answer might be and whether the bill in fact reads the way the, the department wants it to read, I did bring that to the attention of the department. I have also been further in, in discussions with them. We've sorted those issues out and they have addressed the ones that are pertinent in their presentation as well. So everything is, 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 is being addressed, but 
when I present, I'm going to, to talk to fair use, for instance. Doesn't mean that I'm a, 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 an advocate for, for fair use. It simply means that that is what is in the bill before the committee. So I also just want to, to because of this long history of the bill, I just also want to speak a bit about the redrafting, um, that process, because um, there were, were a lot of criticism given um, to the committee on, on, on the Brawls process. But I want to assure this committee that between the fifth parliament and the sixth parliament, and now in this committee, this, these bills, in fact, both of them, have received a lot of attention. Um, there were serious con uh, concerns about the terminology used, and the bills were actually redrafted. There was a whole team that consisted of parliamentary staff, department staff, and experts. There were further experts, a further panel of experts um, that also made, made some, some inputs, and all of the inputs considered um, were considered. Um, the other thing that I also just want to speak to, when we redrafted, and, and I think the bill is introduced, also mentioned it, if I remember correctly, but more important is the concern about the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act being referenced in um, this bill. Now, the problem is that the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act, even though it's not operational yet, is on the statute book. So, for instance, I'll just give one example of how ignoring the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act in our bills will have a negative effect. The, the IP Laws Amendment Act inserts sections 28A to 28N. Our bill, the Copyright Amendment Bill, then inserts sections 28O to S. In other words, it follows on where the, the IP Laws Amendment Act um, stops. Now, um, clause 29 of our bill indicates that 28P and 28S, which is inserted by our Copyright Amendment Bill, constitute defenses to um, an, an offence, a criminal offence. So if we ignore the IP Laws Amendment um, Act and we start with 28A and 28B, which is now inserted by the IP Laws Amendment Act, and the IP Laws Amendment Act comes into operation a year from now, then our Act, the Copyright Act as amended, will have two 28A sections and the question would then be, which one of these is the defense? So we cannot ignore something that is on the statute book. Even if that act becomes repealed at some point in time, we will still consider those sections created by that act as relevant to our processes. So it is unfortunate. I understand that people feel uncomfortable and did not like the IP Laws Amendment Act, um, especially the members of the public who were concerned about including it. Um, but unfortunately, it is on our statute book. It is unfortunate that it is not yet operational and it creates this um, uncertainty. But that is unfortunately what we need to do when we draft. We must take into account every single act that is on the statute book, whether operational or not. So um, the next um, aspect that I want to talk about is the Section 79.1 process. And there were concerns raised in the NCOP referring to the process in the National Assembly, indicating that it was unfair um, how the National Assembly limited itself to certain aspects um, in, in the consideration of the bills. The problem is that the National Assembly was bound by the joint rules, part eight of the joint rules, which deals with the process to reconsider bills. In other words, bills that were referred back by the president in terms of section 70, uh, yeah, section 791 of the constitution. So the rules indicate that the committee must consider and confine itself to the president's reservations. So where there were submissions on other sections, um, the committee was advised to not consider those because to consider those would have meant that the legislative process was flawed because the portfolio committee would not have complied with the joint rules of parliament. So the rules are there and we must comply with them. The process in the NCRP is very different. And the reason for that is because one of the reservations was the classification of the bill. In other words, what was the process that the bill must follow through Parliament? And the Portfolio Committee decided that it will err on the side of caution because we, we the, the court cases indicate to us that where Parliament classifies a bill as a Section 76, 
but it should have been a section 75, it is unlikely that the court will find the process flawed. So it is almost better to err on the side of caution when there is a bit of a conflict or an uncertainty. So that is then what happened. The bills were reclassified as section 76. So the whole process in the National Council of Provinces changed, which means that it must start from scratch um, because it's a whole different process, very, very different process. And that is why in the National Council of Provinces, the whole bill or both bills, in fact, the whole part of the bill is open and the committee can uh, consider any aspect on, on the bills. There were also some concerns raised um, about um, consultations, but um, that, that I, can, I can confirm from my side at least, that what I know about is I, I have seen um, summaries from the department on all submissions. I have seen summaries from um, the support staff on all submissions. I have seen all submissions. So from my side, I can confirm to this committee, to the members, that all submissions have been considered. What we need to, however, um, uh, keep in mind is that considering a submission and accepting what is proposed in that submission are two very different things. It is for this committee, and of course, to consider very carefully every single submission, every proposal that is made, to consider the responses to those proposals. There might be a proposal that has a lot of value, and then the, the responses will confirm that, or there might be something where there is a difference of opinion on what is the best direction to go. There might be a legal view, which I could agree with or which I disagree with. And the committee must then consider both sides um, and decide which seem to them to be the most supported, the most likely to be found, if it's a legal question by, by a court, the most likely to succeed if it is a policy question, um, and then make a decision from there. But it doesn't mean that if a, a proposal in a submission is not accepted, that the submission was in fact not considered. That is simply not the same thing. Um, the next aspect that I want to talk to, now I'm getting to the legal stuff. So the next thing I want to talk to is constitutionality. There were a lot of concerns about the exceptions in the Copyright Amendment Bill constituting arbitrary deprivation. So I want to just talk about arbitrary deprivation because um, I have found over the years when when people feel don't, don't agree with the content of, of a bill, um, they tend to, to say, oh, but this is arbitrary deprivation. Oh, but this is unconstitutional. Um, but we need to look at what that actually means. We can't just make these statements. Um, and it might be that a different lawyer comes to a different conclusion. But I will give to this committee what I have considered, how I've come to my conclusion, and then you can decide uh, whether what I've argued before you now is su sufficiently supported to convince you. So, first of all, it's very important that we keep in mind that Section 25 of the Constitution does not create a right to property. Our Constitution does not have a right to property. We've got a right to equ equality, we've got a right to education, we do not have a right to property. What we do have is a right to not be arbitrarily deprived of our property. And it is very important to make that distinction because it even goes so far, our courts have even indicated that if the deprivation is not arbitrary, then section 36, which de determines the, the limitations and the justification for limitations of, of the rights um, in the Bill of Rights does not even come into play. It is only when, when deprivation is arbitrary, that we then look at whether that arbitrary deprivation is done in terms of section 36. So it's a very important distinction to make. So when we look at arbitrary deprivation, that there's, there's, there's a, the, 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 the constitution gives two requirements, law of general application, and it may not be arbitrary. Now, these laws are laws of general application that apply nationally, to, every, to everybody. So they're definitely laws of general application. The question then is, if we accept that copyright is in fact property, is it then arbitrary deprivation? Um, so we need to keep in mind that 
copyright as such has always had exceptions. The Act provides, and, and, I, and I think one of the presenters mentioned, um, you know, it's called the Copyright Act, not the exceptions to Copyright Act. Well, yes, um, that's, there's other drafting conventions at play there as well, why we call it copyright and not exceptions. But the Copyright Act provides not only for when copyright vests and what you can do with your copyright, but it has always provided for exceptions and limits to your copyright, because that is what a copyright is. A right does not only give you, um, a, a right is not unlimited unless it says it is unlimited. A right almost always, and I mean, even our Bill of Rights has limitations, has some limitations, and that forms part of the right. And that is what our Copyright Act has been dealing with. So if we look at copyright without any limits, so let's say it is unlimited, like I just said, then what we have is that that copyright will affect and will in fact limit other positive rights that are contained in our constitution, the right to equality, to human dignity, to freedom of expression, to a cultural life and to education. And on these specific rights, I'll speak a bit more when I get to the blind SA case because the court highlighted um, how, how copyright affects those rights so beautifully, but I, but I will get there when, when I get there. The purpose of these bills, in other words, is in fact to balance. We want to balance the copyright, but we also want to balance other rights, the rights of a user where it comes to the equality, dignity, freedom of expression, cultural life, education, etc. So the other purpose of the bills is to align copyright with your digital era and to promote multilateral development. So when we look at, at um, how all of these things work, when we look at arbitrary deprivation, um, or first, before I, get, before I get to that, I just first want to show so the purpose of the act, I've, I've now given you the, the two purposes of the bill, the balance and to bring it into line with technical um, development. If we look at international developments in, in copyright, we will see that Canada, and Canada actually has a um, fair dealing, not, not fair use, but Canada was talking about a balance being necessary between the rights of users and copyright holders. Um, there must be a, a proper balance. And the court actually said, user rights are not just loopholes. In other words, it is not just something that, oh, you know, um, you get away with something. It is an actual right because it affects certain human rights. So, well, in fact, the human rights affecting is now I'm combining two, two, two um, um, cases, but that is how, how I see it when I look at all the cases. When you look at WIPO, so um, they, um, they've got a, a document speaking specifically to exceptions and limitations. And they also stress the appropriate balance between the in interests of rights holders and the users of protected works. There was also a Professor Cruz who did a specific analysis of exceptions and limitations. Um, and in fact, um, on, my, on my slide presentation that was circulated to members, in the notes section, I did put links to all of these um, cases and documents if members want to have a further look at that. So uh, Prof Cruz came to a conclusion that there, there is in fact, a, a, less than a third of countries have um, exceptions for libraries, for research, um, and especially in respect of technological um, advances, exceptions that make provision for technological advances. And his finding was that there's an urgent need to update exceptions for the digital aid in order not to undermine efforts to realize the objectives. And then very interestingly, the findings indicated that um, these kind of exceptions are more common in rich countries. Um, they are much better prepared to, for the technological age. And it seems that um, your, your, your poorer countries are lagging behind. Um, and for instance, the, the European Union and your developed group was always first or second when it came to preparedness. So this is something that, that is in the developed world. And um, 
you know, to some extent, it, it, it sometimes felt that it's developed world uh, examples that were put to this committee in, in, a, in opposition of what these bills are trying to do. Um, and I think that that proposal from, from not proposal, but those findings from WIPA is something to, to keep in mind because these two bills are trying to bring a balance and especially in respect of those constitutional rights, which is very important um, from my perspective, because that affects the, the, the legal issues behind this bill. So when we look at arbitrary deprivation, what is that? So I'm finally getting there. And I've already said that the test is narrower than section 36, because that only comes into play if there is an arbitrary deprivation. So when is there a sufficient reason? That is what is necessary, a sufficient reason. If you, if you don't have sufficient reason, it's arbitrary. So what is sufficient reason? And the courts have given us some guidance. Um, I'm specifically here referring to the first National Bank versus West Bank, um, trading as a West Bank um, case versus Minister of Finance, where the court indicated that you must look at the purpose of the law. So we already looked at the purpose of the law, balance and the technological age, preparing us for that. The purpose of deprivations, the persons affected, the nature of the property, and the extent of the deprivation. Quickly on the nature of the property, the court also said, if the property in question is land or a corporeal movable, then there should be a more compelling purpose. Now, intellectual property, and it hasn't been decidedly stated by our courts that it is property, but we expect that it would be accepted as property, but there would be less compelling reasons necessary for a non-corporeal property is what the court then indicated. So I want to specifically, these factors that I've now mentioned, I want to go a bit further onto that to look at the extent of the deprivation. Now, not only do, do we provide in, in the bills four factors for the fair use aspect, um, but each of the specific exceptions have their own specific guidelines, parameters that must be complied with. So the extent of deprivation is not unlimited. It is within very clear delineated areas, uh, parameters. And on my slides, I just give a couple of examples, but um, I'm not going to go through them specifically. Um, most of these include that it must be non-commercial and that you may not exceed the extent justified by the purpose. Um, so just for, to save time, I'm not going to go to read through them. Um, they are in, in the bill. So the question then is, is there sufficient reason? And our office would submit that there is in fact sufficient reason. The, your evaluation would likely be more to the rational re relationship between the means and ends than towards proportionality. In other words, that section 36 um, argument. However, three-step, and I'll come to the three-step test. If we look at the three-step test, there is in fact some proportionality in there. And my argument would be that our bills comply with the three-step test. So even if found to be arbitrary deprivation, I would argue that section 36 would be complied with as well. But in my view, it is not arbitrary deprivation, the, exchange, the exceptions and limitations. If we look at the purpose of the law, I've indicated already balanced technological, that's a very valid reason to, to make these amendments. The nature of the property, intellectual property is not land, so the incorporeal less um, compelling reasons would be sufficient. The extent, it's not the extent of the, the, the um, deprivation, there are limits, it is not unlimited. So the, the, other, the other, of course, the other aspect that could render um, actually the whole bill unconstitutional is that of procedural fairness. Um, and that would also be taken into account when it comes to arbitrary, a test for arbitrary um, deprivation. But I think I've, I've stated already, you know, this bill, these bills come from 2017. Um, there was a lot of work done on them. It was not just a, a, a committee, um, a committee, none of the committees can be accused of just railroading these bills through. A lot of experts were consulted. Um, a number of consultations in the public um, were made. All submissions were, were considered. The classification has now been changed. So even that process um, cannot be held against these bills. I cannot see these bills being found um, to not pass constitutional muster procedurally. We have really gone the extra mile. And um, both, both committees in both houses 
in both parliaments have gone the extra mile on this. The other constitutional issue that was raised is that I call it the Section 22 top, because it deals with trade, the right, you have the right to choose your trade, occupation, or profession. Now, the problem is that um, if legislation, we may make legislation to regulate a, a trade or, or occupational profession. So, for instance, uh, like like we've got the, the um, uh, legislation regulating medical professionals, regulating um, lawyers, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, that is the kind of um, legislation foreseen by Section 22. But now, what the courts have found in the South African Diamond Producers Organization case is that when the legislation actually goes so far as to make it impossible for a person to enter into a professional occupation or trade, then that would be against Section 22. So there must be an effective limit or an effective bar. And, uh, uh, for instance, what I could, could give as a quick example would be if legislation were to say that um, Due to safety measures, all females are, that are shorter than 1.5 meters may not um, become uh, an engineer working with a certain machine. Uh, that, that would definitely be an entry. I would not be able, I'm shorter than 1.5, I will not be able to enter into that profession. That would be an effective bar to me. So you will then have to look at section 36, whether there's a reasonable uh, proportionality, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now when we look at these bills, there is no effective bar. Um, what it does is to correct the balance that is there. Because, and, and the, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that um, most of the presenters spoke from the point of view of the producers, uh, the, the, the big houses, um, the companies, um, and how um, having this balance corrected towards your author, in other words, your actors, your performers, your um, uh, writers, your songwriters, um, they are all authors as per the, the Copyright Act. To have this balance brought back um, is, now, is affecting these companies um, because, you know, they will make less profit because they, they need to be more profit sharing with these, um, with the author. But what we didn't hear a lot of and which is as valid is that the wording of the act as it currently stands is in fact an effective barrier to some authors. There were one or two that came to present um, in, this, in this committee. There were also one or two that came to present in other committees um, about the dire circumstances that makes it impossible for them to actually um, continue being an, an author as, as envisaged by the act. So it's very necessary that we look at both sides because both sides have the right to section 22. And we must look at whether these bills create an effective barrier. And in, in our office's view, the bills in fact uh, corrects a current situation where there is an effective barrier to authors um, to do the necessary work. The international treaties, I'm not going to say too much about this. I think the department will speak to this a lot, but I do just want to quickly um, raised with the committee that, um, in fact, there was a lot of consultation about uh, around the treaties. Um, the bills are adopting actually many clauses from the Electronic Information for Libraries model law, from the Marrakesh Treaty, um, and also from other copyright regimes um, that are following these treaties. And there were lots of consultations held, um, and there was also a technical panel that advised on these treaties, and all of these views were in fact considered. Now, another thing that I just want to point out when it comes to international treaties, none of the treaties mentioned are currently binding on South Africa. We want them to be binding. So that is why these bills are before this committee. They are giving effect to these treaties. But if, and I'm not saying that we are against any treaty, but any aspect that is not compliant is not going to render the bill unconstitutional. It is something that will have to be dealt with in respect of what exceptions that treaty allows, because treaties do not form part of our constitution. Their obligations must be considered when we consider the Bill of Rights. And that is the only effect for these um, 
treaties in respect of our constitution. So in effect, um, the advice that I've given to the to the committee before was actually that the, the treaties should not be part of the section 79 referral, um, but the, the portfolio committee decided to err on the side of caution rather. Um, but we need to also keep in mind, so first of all, it's not a constitutional issue. Do we comply? Well, the department will advise further, but that has so far what I could see from the treaties that I've compared with clauses in the bill. And we must also keep in mind what WIPO itself is saying on limitations and exceptions. They indicate that it will vary from country to country because of social, economic, and historical conditions. And in fact, international treaties acknowledge this diversity by providing general conditions for the application of limitations and exceptions. And they leave national legislatures to decide if a particular limitation or exception is to be applied, and if it is the case, the, to, to determine the exact scope. Now, I read that, and I don't like reading a presentation, but I read that because that was very important. The legislature of a country can, ex, can decide the, ex, the, the exact scope of a limitation that is allowed in terms of treaties. I also quickly want to talk about the three-step test because there was a lot of concern about that, not um, are the bills not complying with that. Um, this is not something that I that I consider from a legal point of view. So not, not an international uh, treaty point of view. I consider it from a legal point of view. What the three-step test says is that any exceptional limitation must be confined to certain special cases, must not be con in conflict with the normal exploitation of the copyright work, and must not unreasonably prejudice the, the legitimate interests of the rights holder or the author. I then found a number of entries um, on, on the internet, uh, international comparisons, because we don't have any court case that has considered the three-step test um, in respect of intellectual property law. So I had to go globally. The Max Planck Institutes indicated that the three steps must be considered as a whole. You can't just break them up separately. They one joint requirement. Furthermore, they don't require you to do a narrow interpretation. You must look at the objectives and the purposes of your exception and your limitation. And then the Max Planck Institute specifically indicated that fair use would be a specific instance for purposes of the three-step test, because they what they argued was that fair use is not more or less foreseeable than fair dealing. So they indicated further that the test should be interpreted in a way that respects the legitimate interests of third parties. So the other thing about um, that I want to specifically um, refer, that I found rather, was the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Now, although we are not a signatory to this, this has been used by our courts, in fact, to interpret treaties. So um, I thought that we could definitely go there. Now, the USA already applied fair use a, a long time, time ago. Um, and what the Vienna Convention indicates is that it is necessary to consider the actions of member states. So in other words, if a treaty reads A, but member states act B, then B actually becomes how the treaty should be interpreted. So the USA was already using fair use when it joined, a number of other signatories after joining um, Byrne changed to fair use. And in fact, the Australian Law Reform Commission found that looking at the history of, of the test itself, the three-step test, um, the words of the test, looking at how member countries um, acted, they are of the view that fair use would in fact comply with the three-step test. So in our offices, um, um, proposal would be that, in fact, they do comply. There was also some um, indication of some proposals to include the actual wording of the three-step test in the bills. Um, on this slide, I am making a, a quick sort of a, a comparison between fair use, fair practice, and the three-step test. Now, basically, most authors that I could find, in fact, all authors that I could find, indicated that the three-step test is not intended to be included in legislation. It is intended to provide a guide. So as the Max Planck, Max Planck Institute indicated, you look at them globally. So they give you a guidance. 
um, and you look at the words of your of your law and whether they fall within that guidance. But if you look at, at the factors, they are very much aligned. Some, some duplicate um, in one or the other, but you can find them to be aligned. So it is just important that we capture the intention. So in fact, in the portfolio committee, we did add the wording of the three-step test in one or two exceptions, and it just became impossible. That exception became null and void. It, it, it would not have been something that can, in fact, be implemented because you will have your normal exceptions plus certain other exceptions, and, and it just did not make sense. So from our office, we would not recommend that the wording of the three-step test is specifically included in the bills. Um, our argument is that the exceptions, as they are currently worded, do comply with what the three-step test envisage. Now I get to the specific issues in, in the bill. Um, the, the first one relates to definitions. Achenira, I think I'll go, I'll go quite fast um, because it's more interpretation uh, concerns. I don't think they need a lot of, of explanation. Um, authorized entity, there was some proposals to specifically mention the spheres of government. It's not necessary. Government includes all spheres. There were also some requests to specifically uh, uh, um, define certain terms. But the reason for definitions in a bill is that the words in that definition section are either unclear generally, may have more than one, one meaning, or are in fact being extended or limited to its normal meaning. So, for instance, when we define board, and I'm sure the committee members would have seen the definition of board quite often in legislation. Now, board is the body that um, oversees a company. We all know that. But then we define it in an act to say board means the board established by Section 3. So when we talk about board in this act, we specifically mean the water board or the electricity board or whatever board it is in section three and not any other board. So we limited the meaning of board. And that is all that we use definitions for. If a word has the meaning that it has in the dictionary, we need not define it in the bill. I mean, otherwise our definition sections would become pages and pages and pages and actually would just add to interpretation challenges. Broadcast. I, uh, working through the department's um, presentation quickly, that they were, were, were recommending that broadcast, uh, the definitions for broadcast, if I understand them correctly, but they will speak to it a bit more, uh, should be removed from the bills. The, the definition for broadcast has been very contentious. And the problem is, is that the Department of Communications is busy developing a definition for broadcast that would uh, comply with current technology, but also as technology grows. And that has been in the making, I think, since the start of this bill. So and I don't think it's an easy, easy task. Um, you know, so to ask it from, from, from this committee to agree on a, on a definition for broadcast is actually a very impossible task. So what was decided in the portfolio committee was just a, a basic definition for, for broadcast. But I understand that the department is saying, let's go back to the act and we wait for for the Department of, of Communication, which is also in order. I can't see a problem with that. The definition for performer, the major issue was the word extras. But um, now an extra is not a performer, it's an extra. It's, it's a very, um, you know, if, we, if you look at the industry, no one in the industry will tell you that an extra is a performer. Um, that is simply not, not how it is. And also the bill's definition is exactly the same as the Beijing Treaty which speaks to, if, if you compare the two, like, like I've got here on, on, on the slide, you'll see that's exactly the same. Um, the one is just singular because we draft in the singular and not plural. That's really the only difference. Um, technological protection measure. You know, here I'm not going to say too much because there's a lot that can be said about technological protection measure. Um, but in, in the portfolio committee, there was a request for making that it more strict, making technological protection measure more strict. The problem with that is that technological protection measures in especially developed countries has a much easier, um, it is, it's much easier to obtain the, the permission from your from your big company to, to circumvent the technological protection measure. Um, but if you're in, in Africa, and in fact, I, I found a couple of, of articles on, on this that, that was quite concerning. Um, Technological protection measure. Um, there was actually one instance during COVID that I, that I came across with the lockdowns where a hospital could not, 
their, their engineering staff, their medical engineers, could not adjust the respirators because of a technological protection measure. The, the more um, well-known example is of a person who, who needs to just quickly fix his tractor, busy plowing, something happened in the engine, but he, he can't because he can't circumvent the technological protection measure. So he has to take that tractor into John Deere and John Deere will then fix it there. So the big problem and, and um, the article that I came across that I thought was, was very informative about how the challenges that the USA is facing, they're a developed country, the challenges that they are facing because of a strict technological protection measure and, and circumvention device um, definition in their law is that um, they, they, they don't have a link between the actual infringement of that technological protection measure and the use. So, um, it, and, and if you simply say you may not circumvent, you're taking that link away. And the, the challenge of that is that the impact of taking that link away is that we lose the freedom to arrange our own conduct to our benefit. In other words, um, I have purchased um, I've purchased a CD. I want to put it on my on my laptop, but there's it's actually a very bad example. I apologize, but let me continue with it. But there is something on that CD that prevents me from um, from putting it onto onto my laptop. I can't circumvent it, but it's my CD. And I don't have a CD player at home. I only have my laptop. That's how I play uh, all my CDs. But it's my product. I bought it legally, but I can't do anything about it. And that is what that first factor talks about. We lose the freedom to arrange our conduct to our own benefit. We, we must play. We must use the product. We must use that CD the way the CD maker intended me to use it, i.e. on a CD player. The second thing that we lose is the freedom of third parties to offer accessories, consumable service and repairs for the products that we own. The tractor example, the farmer can't just contact the, the mechanic that he knows that lives next door and say, quickly come and check my tractor for me. He must take the tra tractor to John Deere. So you lose that freedom as well. And then um, the third one is actually a security risk because you, you um, lose the freedom to uncover and publicize defects in products. So this is actually a, a, a big challenge that, that we need to, to look at. So from our side, our office would not recommend that um, technological protection measure or circumvention device be amended at all. Um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go a bit faster. I see I'm taking a bit long with my, uh, with my presentation. Visual art, artistic work, and um, this is again, just a, a interpretation matter. Uh, we don't, um, they say all visual work, all artistic works are visual. Um, this is more of a policy uh, concern, but like I say, with the dictionary definition, if that is what it means, we would have kept that, but we are going a bit broader. Um, adding definitions, I've already spoken to that. The fact that the performance protection refers to the Copyright Act, these act work together. They really work together. They, they, the one depends on, or the performance depends on copyright in more than one way. And it is in that instance easier to refer to the copyright, I mean, a copyright act for a definition, because if you amend that definition in future, you don't have to amend both acts, you just amend the one. Um, the other one was about producer and the fact that it should indicate um, there's no provision for corporate entities, just to say in South African law, the word person in fact, um, includes corporates. So we don't, we, person is, is natural and juristic persons. Notice that the department is also proposing a review of dramatic person, that, that definition, but they, I think they will speak to that. They will be able to do so much better. Um, sections 5, 2 and 21, 2, this deals with local organizations. I'm not going to say too much about it because the department has a very good um, presentation on that. Um, but just to indicate that when it comes to including um, local organizations in sections five and sections 21, it um, is not by itself arbitrary if there is a rationale. And there is a rationale that the department will, will speak to a bit more. I think let me rather leave it there. Retrospective application of clauses five, seven and nine, there was a request to bring retrospectivity back. The problem is, although there is a reason to, to go retrospective, so what this dealt with was that Going forward, authors will, even if an author sells their rights in, 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 a, in a book or, or a, um, 
uh, music work or whatever, there will be continuous royalties being paid to them. And royalty is specifically defined in these sections. So it means something different from, from other, other applications of, of the word royalty. The problem, however, is that it becomes arbitrary deprivation because we don't know the extent of this retrospective action. We don't know um, who it will affect. At this point in time, it will affect anyone. So it will, will affect people who were historically disadvantaged. It will also affect people, it will also benefit people who, who were not historically disadvantaged, who were able to argue and negotiate for a, for a proper contract. So there's the one thing. Um, what would happen if um, it, it, the, the, the work was, the copyright in the work was sold uh, and that person who bought it sold it onto a third party um, at a very reasonable price? The third party paid a, a good sum for it. It's that this middleman who, who exploited the author. What do we do in those circumstances? So it is just too much uncertainty and uncertainty in law is not constitutional. It's against the rule of law. And that is why we um, recommended that that rather be taken out of the bill. The royalties I just spoke to, to say that it's specifically defined in these clauses and it means something different. Now, there was an argument that author is not, um, it's, it's not the correct term, but, but that is not the situation. Section 6A, 7A makes provision for two scenarios. So you have a copyright author, uh, owner who is not the author that is exploiting the work. So copyright owner bought it and is exploiting the work. You have the author who is the copyright owner, hasn't sold it yet, but authorizes a third party, maybe a license to do something. And that is then what this section deals with. And you need to make provision for both scenarios. So there is an amendment that I suggest that could perhaps make it a bit more clear. I'm not going to go into the amendment as much. That is simply what it says. It, it makes it more clear that there might be a situation where your copyright owner is not the author and where the author is, in fact, the copyright owner. I also, um, um, I, I believe I, I, it was circulated to members, a list of the amendments that, that is being proposed from, from our office. In respect of um, Clause 7, this um, deals with national treatment, um, and I saw that the department has a, has a very good slide on this or speaking to this, so I won't say too much on this, um, except to say that the concerns that were raised, I did check that, but it seems to me that there is, in fact, a reciprocal duty provided by the reference to Section 37, so that was the one concern. And the other concern was that it was superfluous because there's already provision for visual artistic works. But if you look at the sections that are affected, you'll see that visual artistic works are limited, they're grouped together. Um, and, and that is why there would be the additional reference. Fair use, I've already started talking about this. The department is proposing um, to, a change to the fourth factor in section 12A, and I'll let them speak to that a bit more. Um, on my last slide, I make a comparison with the USA wording, and, and I think then that could help members as well when considering the proposal that the department is making here. Um, the, there was, uh, the, the which model to use, like I said, well, is, is a policy matter, but there was um, indication that this is um, something that, that, is, that is not desirable. This way we have Section 12A and then specific, a, specific, a specific list of exceptions. But all that this is, is that there are specific exceptions that we want to provide for. These exceptions, in fact, most of them address a specific constitutional right, education, um, um, the, the, the rights of, of persons with disabilities. And what we then have is a general 12A, which gives you the factors for matters that we have not foreseen which is in fact a very responsible way of drafting legislation. Because, I mean, look at these bills, they have been before parliament for six years. If that is how long it takes to, to amend an act, we need to be cognizant of what the future might bring and that we don't know everything. The, the other thing that I noticed from the department is that in respect of section 12C, they are proposing to remove adaptation. I don't have a legal um, concern with that. And I believe the department will, will speak to that a bit more in detail. And this is where blind is a come. So here I'll spend a bit of time, but also not too much because I see that I'm taking very long. Now, first of all, the one concern about section 19D is that it goes much further than the Marrakesh Treaty. It provides for all works, provides for all types of disability, whereas Marrakesh focuses 
on persons with a visual disability. And um, if we look at the, the Marrakesh Treaty, it clearly indicates that a, a country may in fact um, make provision for other copyright limitations and exceptions for the benefit of beneficiary persons, which are persons with a disability, than what is provided by the treaty. So we can go broader. It also says that um, there is no prejudice to other limitations and exceptions um, provided to, for, for persons with a disability. The third thing that we need to keep in mind is that our constitution compels us to consider equality. And if we give certain rights to persons with a visual disability, and tomorrow there is technology that might help a person with a hearing problem or a person with a mental health problem, why would we then have to re why would those then have to retake this the, the act to the court to fight again for the same right um, as the court has now acknowledged clearly in the blind SA matter does exist? Um, it, it just does not make sense. We need to comply with our constitution and we need to provide for all forms of disability. And the same aspect um, in respect of all works, we, we cannot just limit it to, to one aspect. And in fact, there was a good example given by, by Blind SA in that um, you can't just limit it to a literary work because if you look at sheet music, what is sheet music? Is it a literary work or is it, um, because it, it could be in a book, could be in a book form, or is it a musical work? Because if you look at the definition of musical work, it could be a, word, a work consisting of music, exclusive of words or actions. So you might have a situation where a, a blind musician um, is limited to access sheet music because there's an argument that is a musical work, which is not covered by 19D. And these are the kind of things and taking into account our constitution that are simply unnecessary. Um, when we look at, uh, and I'll, I'll get to that as well, because I think that might be one of the, the concerns was the, the unfair application of, of section 19D. But we'll get there and, and, and I will show to members that there's no way that section 19D will, will, can be used unfairly. Um, it, it just cannot be. So the blind is a case specifically indicated that the act unjustifiably, unjustifiably limits the rights of persons with visual and print disabilities. And the constitutional court made it very clear. And I think I had I have a little bit of, yes, I figured it out in the notes page. So I won't go into too much detail, but it might be worth a read. Um, infringing the rights to equality, human dignity, freedom of expression, cultural life. And there's also no justification that can be given for the limit in respect of the right to education. And um, the court then considered 19D, but because the facts before the court was on visual impairment, the court could not use the words of section 19D. So some of the presenters who indicated that section 19D was found to be not fit for purpose only gave half the picture. 19D was not fit for purpose for, for the judgment in blind SA because a court cannot go broader than the facts before it, um, which is a pity, but that is unfortunately how courts work. They can only make an order on the facts before it. So because 19D includes other works, includes other disability forms, um, forms of disability, um, the court could not use 19D. It did not say that 19D was not a suitable section for the bill. It is simply not suitable for its judgment. And that's a very different aspect. So the next couple of slides deal with the proposed changes. Um, I'm again not going to make too much, go, go too, in too much detail into this. The wording is there and it is simply to provide clarity and make sure that we don't have a, 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 con a problem between how the bill reads and how the Marrakesh Treaty reads that sufficient provision is made. So for instance, there was, um, in respect of authorized entity. Now, an authorized entity is someone who may, may make an accessible ac uh, um, accessible format copy um, for a person of, with, a, with a disability. And just to make sure that it could be any entity, not just a government institution or nonprofit on, um, organization, but very importantly, that this is done on a nonprofit basis. So that is actually proposed to be put into the, the actual um, wording. Then if we go to the section itself, the first concern there in, in, in subsection one was that that authorized entity 
seems to be something that should be prescribed, but that is simply uh, interpret. We we draw. I drafted that incorrectly. Um, let me take that responsibility. It was never intended for authorized entity to be prescribed. Otherwise, we would not have to find it. Um, so it is just to move it to the front. So it is very clear that there's no regulations applying to authorized entity. And then there was also a concern that you can't have. Um, a new accessible copy made every time. You, you must be able to make a copy from a copy if you are an authorized entity and you're doing this, of course, for a person with a disability. So that is just the proposal to have a, a new uh, subsection three, which is based on the court's read in, in fact, that makes it clear that if you have a copy of the work, you can make an accessible format copy of that copy. And the same applies to 19D3. Um, and then there's also something in respect of 28P. This, this, um, this deals with circumvention of a technological um, protection measure. And in fact, I looked at 28P2 and I realized that um, when we added service to the definition, that wasn't there uh, from the start. So then at some point towards the last of the amendments that were made to the bill, we added service to technological protection uh, measure circumvention device. And suddenly 28P2 no longer made sense because when we get to 28P1, it says that you can, if, you, if you're doing this for a, for a lawful reason, you can in fact um, circumvent the, the technological protection measure or ask someone to do it for you. Then two comes and says, if you can't do it, you need to approach the, the, the owner. But I'm already being able to ask someone else to do it for me when I approach the owner. So that's when I realized when we added service, um, the, the, the request to the owner actually became, becomes null and void. So the proposal would be to delete that and then the consequential amendment um, to, the, to the, the subsection below to just not refer to that specific uh, section that we've now deleted. The next slide just gives a full overview of all the amendments that I'm proposing. Um, members can make a note of it, a slide that he did circulate a, a list of all the amendments that I'm proposing. The remainder are actually just um, not, not, I don't think there's, there's significant proposals further. Um, clause 24, there was just a concern that when we look at what the remainder of the rights are, it's not clear who it goes to. So there's just a proposal how we can word it to make clear that the remainder in, of the rights, in fact, vest in the author, but it kind of speaks for itself. But, but you know, laws must be drafted as clear as possible. So that would be something. The 25 year reversion right, um, deprivation of property, well, it will only apply prospective. It won't apply backwards. So in other words, if I now enter into a contract, I will know that after 25 years, this thing that I'm buying will revert back to the author. So those are the terms of my contract. That's simply how that trade will work. We are regulating a trade going forward. So there's no deprivation of property at all. Um, offenses. There was a concern that the authority of the owner is, is necessary. Now, when it comes to an offense, I agree that that's a concern. Because if it was a licensee that gave me the authority, then I would have committed a, an, an offense if it was required, the owner themselves must have given it. But I've worked through all the offenses and there's nothing that requires the owner's specific permission. And on top of that, it requires knowledge. So in other words, if I am of the view that the licensee was duly authorized to do this, um, and I then proceed to use the, the, the product in, in the way that I want, I can say, but I did not know that the owner didn't give it, and it will then not constitute an, a criminal offence, that would be a sufficient defence. So I don't think that there's a problem with, with permission given by the owner um, itself. There was a proposal to adding circumstances, but circumstances just introduce vagueness, and, and with it, when it comes to offences, we need to be very clear. Uh, you're playing with people's lives, and and and, and I, I think we need to be very clear when it comes to an offence. There was also a concern about strict liability. Like I said, no, knowledge is absolutely a requirement. Strict liability is where I commit an offence even not knowing it. So I'm walking and I don't even know, I'm not looking where I'm walking because uh, I'm, I'm deep in thought. I go through a gate that actually said no entry and um, I'm caught inside. I will be liable even though I didn't realize that I was walking through the gate. That's strict liability. 
that is not the case in our offences. Knowledge is a requirement in, in every system, in, in, in every instance. There was a, um, one thing perhaps that, that I could explain in how we draft is section 25, 27.5c is drafted as a, something we call a sandwich clause. So that means your introductory sentence, the top one, and the closing sentence, the bottom one, applies to everything in between. So in respect of both paragraphs A and B, those will only be a, a, an offence if there isn't a defence in terms of section 28X and the person knew that the act was infringing on copyright. Um, commercial activities, whether that should be an offence or not, the department will speak to that. Whether it should be an offence or rather a civil remedy, the department will also speak to that. There is something between uh, uh, subsection 5B, 2 and 3, um, it makes it seem as if there is something that can be done without knowledge, and that should not be the case. So the proposal is that um, subsections, uh, uh, sorry, subparagraphs two and three be combined to make it very clear that the service is, is rendered and you know, not just rendering the service in itself. Um, section 28P. The, it, there was a concern again about um, this one is actually quite an interesting one. Um, what the clause indicates is just exceptions. It doesn't speak to um, it doesn't speak to to limitations at all. And yes, that is a problem because not all exceptions are not all exceptions are limitations, or not all limitations are exceptions. So there's definitely a requirement for um, that to be clarified. So we would recommend that it is by law, including an exception, so that limitations are in fact also provided for. Um, there was a concern that the tribunal may not um, call witnesses, but there's no way the court will interpret that section in a way that, that comes, that leads to an absurdity. Um, you know, the same with, with um, in fact, I think I skipped over that now, but when it comes to section 19D with, with um, accessible format copies, uh, a court is not going to, to reach a, an absurd situation where someone who can see is now repairing a wheelchair and then somehow the accessible format copy now applies to the, to the person who can see. That is simply an absurd interpretation. The person who can see must look at the specifications that have been issued formally um, or uh, is a lawful copy. Um, in repairing the, the, um, the, the, the wheelchair for, for the person who, who, who has a, um, a, who is a person with a disability, that section simply doesn't come into play. So we must always keep in mind the purpose of a section. A court is not going to make an absurd interpretation. When it comes to, 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 the, to the functions of the tribunal, if the tribunal um, sections indicate that witnesses will be questioned, of course, witnesses must be allowed. How can a witness not be allowed before the tribunal? It is sometimes not necessary to spell everything out um, in the act. There was also a, a very big concern about compulsory um, contract terms. Um, now, first of all, the way it is worded is that it will be terms that must be included. So what it intends is protection, and that's it. It's just protection that is intended. It will not be every single term that is, that is prescribed. It will, for instance, be that you must make sure that Section 6A is taken into account when you enter into this contract. So what are your provisions on six, section 6A in this contract? Because the author might not know about the rights in section 6A and therefore enter into a contract that excludes it. And, and that is where this protection comes from. And the same goes with um, contractual terms being unenforceable if they go against the act. It is simply because some authors are not aware of all the rights that this act actually affords them and then they enter into contracts that are exploitative and that excludes some of the rights of the of the um of the act so first of these there's nothing wrong with the with the prescribed minimum minimum terms um, it is simply for protection it does not affect contractual freedom there are so many provisions made how um how you can you know, structure according to, to, to your working process. But the fact is the act must be complied with. And these minimum terms and, st and, and conditions that will be prescribed will deal with those rights. So and that is just what, is, what, what, what hap is happening there. And our office is of the view that that should be a, a, 
no, there should not be any problem there. So my last two slides, I just want to talk about litigation as a concern. So there, were, there was a concern that the whole bill will be declared invalid, but that, that is not correct. Um, unless there are procedural concerns, and I've already pointed out there's no procedural concerns. Um, this bill, <laughs> these bills have been really, really gone the extra mile in every every turn. Um, and we've got more than enough proof to show the steps that, that have been made to show the court um, that parliament has really gone the extra mile on this. Um, so if there is a clause found to, or section found to be unconstitutional, that will simply be taken out of the act. So it will just be those two sentences or three sentences, whatever that will be taken out of the act. And again, I can say that from our officer's view, there's no doubt that every clause in this bill or these bills will pass constitutional muster. Um, we've had more than one opinion confirming that it will pass constitutional muster. Um, keeping, especially keeping in mind the balance that it's trying to bring between various um, constitutional rights. But I'm not the constitutional court and they might find something is unconstitutional, but then only that will be excised. There was one presenter that indicated that um, in respect of fair dealing, there has only been one court case so far. Now, I'm not sure what she meant by that because I found uh, um, on, on um, the, pro the law program that the parliament uses, when I searched fair dealing with copyright, I found over a thousand cases that dealt with fair dealing. And those are only the reported cases. Um, in, in the Birchall's um, uh, on IP law, there was 21 cases that were discussed that dealt with fair dealing. So it is not fair to say that, that the one system will cause more or less litigation than the other. Litigation happens. That's what happens with 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 um, with matters. We have a difference of opinion, and then one way to sort that is to go to the court. So um, there's also concerns that there's not enough guidance given to courts, but that is simply not correct. Section 12a gives four factors that will be considered. There's also each specific exception that has their own guidelines on, on what can be used. <clears throat> then there was also a, um, a statement at, at some point that the USA law is not compatible with our law. Now, I'm, I'm not sure why that would be the case. Why English and common law would be more compatible with South African law? Because we no longer are an English or common law country. We are a constitutional country. Our law is based on our constitution. And only insofar as our constitution gives effect to other forms of law, does our country recognize it. So yes, common law, insofar as it does not conflict with the constitution, is acknowledged in our country. Um, that doesn't mean that we're a common law country. And um, in more than one case, our courts have indicated that they will consider the judgments of other countries, especially where there is, has been such a rich history as in the, the USA. So when we look at the USA wording, you will see that, that the wording that we have is, is very, very, very similar. I think that fourth um, factor, like I said, the, the department wants to change that a bit. Um, that is the one, the substitution effect, that, that is where they have a problem. But the wording of the US is the effect on the use on potential market or value of work. And um, I even found a, a whole section on the website um, in, in the USA where you, where you type in a scenario and it gives you cases that dealt with that scenario. So there's more than enough examples um, to look at. Um, if, a, if a user in South Africa is a bit concerned, um, I mean, my advice would be go and look at the USA thing, if, if, if that website, if you can find your example there, um, at least you know there's something that you can rely on should something happen. Um, but I would definitely not um, say that law should not change simply because we're scared of litigation. Um, if that was the case, we probably would not even have adopted our constitution. It brought a very big difference in the South African law. And especially because these bills are giving effect to the constitution, um, I don't think we should be scared of, of litigation. Um, Chair, I took much longer than I thought I would take. I do apologize for that, um, but that is the end of my, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Fanomeve, uh, for the uh, presentation. I uh, just want to check if uh, Mr. Shamara Ali wants to add anything before we hand over to the department. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, honorable members and colleagues. Um, Chair, just one point with regards to the procedural requirements. I do concur um, with the legal uh, analysis given by um, 
Advocate Van um, And I do concur as well, in addition, um, with the, that the committee has indeed met all procedural requirements um, thus far in processing the bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, honorable members, let's allow the department uh, to take us through. Uh, after that, then we will ask uh, questions uh, for clarity. As uh, I, I suggest that uh, uh, DDG, uh, Dr. Thomas, maybe you should uh, uh, start on uh, slide nine. Uh, the minister has uh, given the opening remarks, uh, touch uh, uh, on the issues uh, that are also on other slides up to uh, slide eight. If you can just take us straight to slide nine on, on different sheets, uh, but also if you can also touch on the uh, questions of uh, policy that uh, advocate Fanameva uh, 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 referred to, uh, but also uh, some other proposals in terms of amendments and also uh, definition, uh, for example, um, definition on the author, uh, I didn't see it uh, on the slide of, of, of the department, if you can also talk, talk to that as well. Uh, over to you, DDG, uh, Masoch. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good, uh, good morning to uh, honorable members uh, and good morning to you, Chair. Uh, wishing you more uh, recovery and good health. Um, and a wonderful year ahead uh, as well, even though it's not New Year, <laughs> we're done with that part. <laughs> um, Chair, before I start with the presentation, I would like to recognize my colleagues, if it is, it is okay, uh, just to introduce the team that I'm with in the platform, uh, to just uh, recognize them and to indicate that I come here with a team of uh, colleagues. And uh, before then, just to recognize the uh, uh, advocate van der Merve and her team, the parliamentary staff. Uh, from my side, I'm with uh, Mr. Klaas Mokaba, who is the acting chief director for legislative drafting. I'm with Mr. Desmond Ramabulana, who is the acting chief director for regulatory policy and legislation. Uh, I'm with the advocate Kamba, who is our chief director for legal services and uh, Ms. Mar uh, Marisa van Niekerk, who's also a director for legal services. And I'm with uh, Tulu Felomushi from the ministry and then Ms. Saroj Naidu uh, from the department, uh, parl parliamentary work that she does with us. And then Mr. Gadi Peje from the CIPC, uh, who is the copyright manager responsible for the implementation. And he does a lot of work uh, related to the collecting societies. The commissioner, Advocate Rory Vola, has uh, tendered his apology for this uh, for this presentation. And uh, just as an overview, um, I want to echo the words that were said by the uh, deputy minister, recognizing her in absentia in the meeting, uh, that uh, we did look at the submissions. And I would like to thank everyone, the experts, uh, the professors from the different uh, industries who contributed to the uh, improvements into the legislation and to indicate that we acknowledge that there has been, this has been a very long process. There has been different challenges. Um, and we have, uh, as a department, uh, we have uh, take it, taken uh, your input into consideration and also recognizing the different uh, challenges that um, have been recognized across the sectors with the bills and the processes. But I also uh, would like to thank the advocate for clarifying the processes and the leg legalities around the constitutionality of different provisions. So I will not go into the areas that she went into except for the areas where there should be clarity. So I'll try my best not to repeat a lot of what she has said so that we save time and we don't duplicate uh, the issues. Chair, if it is okay, is it fine if I put that presentation but then I remove my face from the screen? Is that um, acceptable? That's acceptable, yes. All you can right. go. Gonna... And uh, I think the deputy minister is still around here. Yeah. Oh, she's still in the platform. Uh, yeah. good, uh, good morning, uh, deputy minister. I heard that you were going to leave uh, within an hour. So sorry about that. Uh, thank you for being with us still in the I'll platform. Leave. I'll leave again. Thank you. Thank you, DM. All right. Okay, let me stop the video. Okay. 
So um, the presentation is going to be very brief. I'll try to keep it very brief and uh, go into the slide that the chair has proposed I start with. And um, on the, for the honorable members, um, we've included the objectives of the bills just to assist with the with the with the um, where we are coming from, the purpose of the bill of the of the copyright amendment bill, and um, some of the issues that have transpired before that the deputy minister has spoken to. So I will be more um, brief, but I'll try to cover as much as I can in terms of what has been raised. We went through the submissions, we read them. And we grouped some of the comments. So if you, there is a comment you see that was made by your entity or uh, by yourself, and um, but other names are not appearing, it's not because we didn't look at them. Some of them are representative of other comments similar to the ones that are on the, are on the screen. And uh, as advocate, I don't uh, prefer to read line by line. However, for the purposes of recognizing the inputs, I'm going to do that uh, in terms of just going through the public comment, reading them. Uh, and I took most of them, we took most of them verbatim just to make sure that they capture the essence of what was raised, uh, but focusing more on the recommendations and the um, approaches that were recommended. And where we are recommending that there should be changes or proposed changes or a review of a particular provision is because of we are recognizing that um, these are very important uh, bills, uh, talking to the performance protection as well. These are very important pieces of legislation. And in the spirit of uh, balance and uh, uh, collaboration and working together, uh, there's always scope for improvement, scope for uh, reviewing of decisions of where or, or where uh, certain uh, positions were before. The policy positions uh, remain uh, mostly similar, uh, but then where we see that we could look at issues, we have um, endeavored to do so. And I will look at those areas that advocate was indicating because um, it doesn't mean what we had before was incorrect or, but we recognize that it's important that when we move forward, we take into account the views that uh, have been presented because we want a legislation that works that also addresses concerns uh, for the public in general. And to make a pro the process more neutral and balanced uh, and to make sure that there is that fairness as well. So in terms of the, uh, the definition that uh, we are starting with, we start with the definition of broadcast. This definition was uh, debated extensively. So amongst the issues raised, um, there was a concern that the amendment uh, to the, the definition of broadcast is vague and could create uncertainty for the creative sector. And also that until the draft uh, white paper process that advocates spoke to has been finalized and the necessary legislative amendments have been effected, the current definition in the act should be retained. Um, and then um, there, were, there were other experts who were of the view that there is no recognition of the relationship between the definitions of uh, broadcast and that of the uh, program carrying signals. And um, so here they were talking about, it seems as though with the draft bill, um, draft bill uh, definition, somehow the, 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 the uh, program signal, carrying signal was misunderstood and also omitted from that definition. Then um, the issue around the, 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 the definition, the current definition, reducing the scope of broadcast and the protection afforded under the copyright law. Then also that um, the bill as it is, is not fit for purpose in several respects. And in this submission, the respects were alluded to in terms of uh, areas that the current definition was, was not addressing uh, and that the definition in the in both bills uh, they have introduced features that are not uh, compatible or that are not uh, sorry uh, common or clear for example wording such as partially or wholly um, so most of the areas or issues around broadcasting summarized were in these areas and the 
examples that are here, they capture those issues more succinctly, hence they were reflected there. So in terms of our response as the department, we are saying that the definition of broadcast was deliberated and it was considered extensively, even, uh, even in the recent rounds of uh, discussions in the National Assembly. Um, areas that were of concern previously were around the alignment to the treaty language and that certain wording should be inserted in the definition. Um, however, we also recognize that there was these processes that were underway uh, with the Department uh, of Communications that deals with the Electronic Communications Act of 2005. There are also treaty deliberations around the, uh, the, the definition of broadcasting, but in the last discussions in the National Assembly, there were and unintended consequences that we're discussing around licensing, uh, implications of wire or wireless means of uh, communication, of, 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 of broadcasting. So those concerns um, were, 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 were there. And then the fact that there's this ongoing uh, process of the legislative review around this. So initially we were of the view, the bill, the, 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 the the definition as it is in the bill was uh, was covering various areas, even though we acknowledge that it had some challenges and some gaps. Um, however, with the future direction of policy that is still under development, that is still being worked on, our and, and we were also of the view that the definition should stand as it was in the bill. Um, we, we, we think that we can look at um, retaining the definition in the act. Reason being that um, the concerns that are raised uh, affect the stakeholders who are mostly, who raise this, who are entities in the broadcasting sector. And with the current act, uh, the definition um, can be used because it seems to be more acceptable uh, compared to the one we had in the bill. So by so saying, it doesn't mean that our view is that the one in the bill is not working. It's just that um, in the spirit of uh, trying to uh, create that balance and to hear the stakeholders, we are of the view that we can reconsider it and, and retain the one in the, in the act. So in terms of the confusion with the program carrying signal issue, we were of the view that it was addressed because in the um, amendment bill, where we talk about satellite transmission or satellite, um, the, 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 the satellite implication, we thought that it was addressed in terms, even if it's not in the, right, in the wording of program carrying signal, but we, we took it that they, there is an, a recognition that there should be that transmission by satellite. But then we also note that uh, different areas are subject to various interpretation and it may not be clear enough. So because of that, we, we will be retaining the original definition that is in the act. We recommend that to the committee and we also um, uh, with, our, with our colleagues in parliament, that it's something that we can look at as part of the recommendations. So the next sets of, um, of, of amendments are around the, the, the definitions around the accessible format copy that uh, talk to the Marrakesh uh, Treaty. So even here, I'm going to recognize the, the comments that were made and um, then talk to the responses from the department. So with the first comment, it says that the definition of accessible format copy in the bill is inconsistent with the definition in the Marrakesh Treaty. And in this um, point, the concern raised was around the fact that the scope of the treaty from our side is a bit wider uh, from the works that are, are involved. The treaty looks at the um, uh, literary or, uh, uh, and, 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 and artistic works and the works in the bill are wider, it's different works. And uh, also in terms of the, the nature of the disability that we are referring to, the, be the, 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 the beneficiary person, uh, the persons that we are referring to, the bill in its scope looked at all forms of, um, of, of disability. The advocate spoke to some of them, issues around hearing impairments, uh, different uh, mental areas that require support and that we wanted to ensure that we align to the constitution. So, but this concern is about that. And also um, 
we should align to the to the to the treaty, and that um, the definition of accessible format copy, as in the constitutional court crafted remedy, be adopted as in line with the Marrakesh. So, meaning that the remedies that we are proposing must also take into account the constitutional court uh, judgment that the advocate was talking to and that no change is required to the definition of persons with disabilities as the breadth of definition fulfills South Africans Bill of Rights. So this comment comes from stakeholders who are in support of the fact that we have a wider definition in the, in the bill in terms of um, persons with disabilities. So their concern was that, or their appreciation was that we need to make sure that we don't change this definition. It ret we retain it in line with the, the Bill of Rights and the, of the constitution. And, and there was a comment that the definition of permitted entities as in the constitutional court uh, that is be crafted, be the crafted remedy and be adopted um, in, the, in the definition of authorized entities. And that the, the issue of the national treatment comes in here. The portfolio committee must is implored to ensure that the definition of accessible format copy is aligned to that provided for in the treaty in line with the intention of the treaty and that the definition of beneficiary that aligns with that used in the treaty be inserted in line with the principle of national treatment. If South Africa introduces exceptions that go beyond what is required in international treaties, only South, Africa, South African right holders will suffer from this. So these are some of the concerns. Uh, some of the stakeholders were not verbatim on it, but they were talking more about uh, international uh, alignment and, and, and to the obligations, international obligations. So to these, our responses are that um, the definition of accessible format copy was um, aligned to the treaty. We, are, we recognize that it is more in terms of the other forms of disabilities. And also that the definition of beneficiary person has been widened to address all forms of uh, disabilities in line with the constitution to ensure that uh, we do not discriminate and there's equality. And um, we are also recommending to the committee that those definitions um, be retained in the spirit of the constitution. And we do note the concern about the international rights um, and the international obligation. And um, we, we, have, we are of the view that where treaties are there to guide internationally and the, uh, the, domestic, uh, the domestic policies and domestic obligations, they, they serve minimum requirements. And um, countries are allowed within their laws to, to consider more uh, if it's to the benefit of their citizens. And our reading of the Marrakesh Treaty, um, we and we start, we stand subject to expert uh, correction, expert advice here. But our reading of it is that it does um, it does not have the strict, uh, explicit uh, interpretation when it comes to national treatment. And uh, we saw that in various articles, there is room for national governments to provide guidance uh, on ensuring support through their legal systems and practice, ensuring that they take into account their economic situation, including developmental imperatives, uh, social and cultural needs to persons with disability and ensuring availability of accessible format copies as well as other rights. So we are of the view that uh, we need to make sure that um, the rights of all persons in the Republic are upheld and that we should not discriminate and that um, we should, the law must be wide enough to, create, to, to, to permit or to provide for the rights uh, as provided also in the Marrakesh Treaty, accepting that ours is a bit wider. And many experts have done research that have shown that South Africa is not the only country in the world that is doing this exception. There are many countries where they have adopted the Marrakesh Treaty in line with their national needs and their priorities. And um, uh, with the permission or, and the support of the Select Committee and the NCOP will be one of those countries that do so. Um, in terms of the definition of the permitted entities, um, from our side, we, we noted the comment, while we appreciate the 
constitutional court judgment in terms of its, its, its finding around this issue, we are of the view that we should retain the authorized entity um, in terms of the application of the um, of the of the of the Marrakesh Treaty, um, as long as the rights that are applicable to authorized entities are not uh, are not uh, tempered with, they are left as uh, they are in terms of what the entities are supposed to provide for 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 our beneficiaries. Further on the definitions uh, on slide 12, I'm going to talk to some of the areas that were raised. I think this is where um, the issue of the dramatic works come in. Um, there were concerns raised with the, some of the stakeholders who raised them in the copyright amendment bill talking to the issue of the producer. So that's why the producer is here in this uh, in the in this in the in this slide uh, because they were raised in the copyright com comments. And because the two uh, bills, they are interlinked and they talk to each other, that's why we've inserted them here. So the first one says a further opportunity which was overlooked is that um, the cap was um, to, 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 was to provide clarity on who is viewed as a producer by adding a definition for this term. And also that the, um, there should be words that are added to the definition, especially to incorporate the entity responsible uh, as a producer. Um, then on, to, on, the, on the dramatic work, um, and I, I was in the public hearings when this was uh, discussed and um, in terms of um, the, the gaps in the definition and how the sector uh, was of the view that they were not catered for and they were misunderstood in terms of uh, where they linked with the audiovisual sector. So uh, for that, I thought we thought we should maybe just bring their context in full um, in terms of the area that was uh, in terms of the way forward on what they're recommending just to recognize this issue and to see if it's an area that can be um, maybe looked at even more closely. So the comment says that although the Copyright Act does in fact define dramatic work and the CAP does seek to introduce a definition for audiovisual work, there lacks an appropriate and clear dis distinction between these works. It may be misconstrued that dramatic work would fall under audiovisual work, at least to some extent. And as such, it is imperative to note that although all audiovisual work may be dramatic, not all dramatic work is necessarily audiovisual work. Furthermore, the flawed inclusion of dramatic work under the definition of literal work as it currently stands in the Copyright Act is also an outdated approach which does not accurately depict the complexity of such works. Um, so on the, on, on just to respond to all the areas that have been highlighted from the public in this, in this sphere, uh, from our side, um, there was a, a, a discussion on the definition of the producer um, as provided for in the um, uh, performance protection amendment bill. And also, uh, on the issue of the person uh, and the entity, the, 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 we, we think that it is, in, it is incorporated because in legal terms, person can be both a natural or juristic person. It does not mean when we don't use the specific word entity, person is not um, incorporated. So we recommend that uh, the wording as it is, uh, because it also aligns to the treaty language, be, 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 be retained as it is. So in terms of the dramatic work, the department is of the view that um, this definition can be reviewed uh, with the permission of the, with the, com of the committee. And it, this also, I must clarify, it does not mean that the definitions that are in, in our view, the definitions of audiovisual work, we think that they are sufficient. We also think that the current definition of dramatic work is suffi it suffices. However, uh, we can we recommend that we be given uh, uh, permission with the other team of in parliament to really look at it to just see if. Um, um, it, this can be accommodated in terms of the way that the sector wants to be repre repre represented. When looking at the proposed definition, 
the wording. Um, one did not see where there could be any discrepancies or issues of concern uh, or any limitation. So it's something that um, maybe it can be considered. So that's our recommendation. So just to read the the proposed definition is as it's 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 as, it's as follows. It means any piece for recitation, choreographic work, or mime the scenic arrangement or acting form of which is fixed in writing or otherwise in any compilation of dramatic works. So this is the proposed definition. Um, underneath is the one that is currently in the legislation. I won't read that, but this is just for the committee to recognize that there was this issue raised. It was also uh, represented uh, in the public hearings and um, it addresses a particular group of stakeholders with who perform this kind of works. And our view is that it can be reviewed, it can be looked into, and the committee can make a determination about the definition. So, just, just on that, uh, I'm sorry to, to come in because it's a new uh, definition. How, how does it find expression then in the rest of the, the bill? Because it, it, it can't just uh, be only on the definitions. Uh, section, but uh, how does it find expression? For example, if you, I know you're still coming to the issue of um, uh, say in royalties uh, regarding literary and musical works. For instance, if you, you take it out of literary uh, literary works, uh, that means you will also have another uh, uh, clause uh, that talks to say in royalties regarding um, a dramatic work. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, Shay, well, I must say... My concern is that it should not only uh, be located only under definition, but it, it should find expression as well uh, in, in the body of the bill. Because if you take it out of literally uh, as part of the definition, it means uh, it won't be accommodated on other areas that refer, it talks to the issue of uh, uh, literally, because you you take taking it out of the if you take into account the proposal um, uh, from the public comment. I don't know if you, I, I'm clear. Chair, you are very clear. Um, what what Chair is saying is that what is the implication of including this uh, definition, especially when it comes to other um, areas that talks to say, for instance, the literary works and also the, um, the provisions that are linked to this provision. Chair, I think from uh, the department side, what we just did, maybe it's maybe level one of the process is to is just to note the issues that we raised. Um, we haven't done the, the other work of um, taking it forward because we took it that this is a, a proposed approach. And because we are proposing, we didn't uh, preempt that it's, it's a, well, like a decision because that's when then we'll be starting that process of unpacking the implications with the help of the legal advisors from the department and the legal advisors in parliament. So um, I will be um, misleading if I said anything about the implications at this stage, um, but I recognize that they, they could be such where there are other uh, sub, uh, uh, subsequent uh, amendments that are brought forward should this def definition be considered. So this was just to ensure that we take the, the comment into account, we note it and we bring it forward. So um, the next steps, if it's taken forward would be, then we look at those implications. Uh, Chair, can I continue? Yes, please. Uh, sorry about just because it's a new area. So I just I didn't want to forget it when we have uh, questions for clarity. I thought let me quickly deal with it now. So I, I won't uh, disturb you further. So you can continue until the end. Okay, thank you, Chair. So the, the, the principle, I think, will be more or less the same in, in new areas, especially um, in terms of the implications. When the committee then says we can look at, at these different areas that we are saying to be considered, then the teams can then start looking at the implications. But thank you for that, Chair. Thank you.
Next slide uh, looks at other definitions and uh, the advocate spoke to some of them. So I'm going to be a bit quicker on this. Um, the definition of authorized entity refers to the government. If the intention is to refer to all three spheres of government, then it is submitted that the wording can be improved by referring to any sphere of government. If the intention is to only refer to national government, then definition needs to be inserted. So um, that's, that's one comment around that. Another one similar is around the authorized entity, uh, the nonprofit organization. It says that it is submitted that a definition is to be inserted referring to the legislation in terms of which nonprofit organizations are registered. And uh, then the, we incorporated the comments around the audiovisual work and then the cinematographic work. And uh, some of the comments will look repetitive, but I will just go into them because these were raised as very critical areas, recognizing also the stakeholders who have raised them. Um, the definition of audiovisual work is identical in effect to the current definition of cinematographic film. The term is simply nothing more than a synonym for cinematographic film as defined in the act. And the current definition has a very broad meaning and has been interpreted by the, the court. Um, the next one says the term as defined is largely synonymous with uh, the cinematographic film as defined. However, the definition creates a new genus of work of which cinematograph film is, is a species. Uh, the term cinematograph film as currently used in the act can now have two possible meanings. It is probably better to stay with the existing terminology and delete this definition or possibly have it indicate that it means the cinematograph film, in which case no further changes are necessary. Uh, the next one says the effect of this definition and the use of the term in the bill is to create a category of work eligible for copyright with no corresponding change to section two of the Copyright Act, which lists the eligible works. The term as defined is um, is similar to the last comment. Cinema, it's a, uh, it's synonymous to the audiovisual work, um, uh, and also to say that the current ad, the current uh, the, uh, cinematograph film uh, in the ad can now it, it confuses their meanings for two. And the last one says that the audiovisual works, as opposed to the cinematograph uh, as a work, is eligible for copyright. It is is more eligible for copyright uh, and does not have a rationale because it is derived from the performance treaties, a uh, treaty and not copyright. I think here they're referring to the Beijing, uh, Beijing Treaty. So our response to the comments, and we recognize that um, I think for what I appreciated from our, my side and the team was that it means whichever one we use, um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's fine because they are synonymous to each other and they represent a similar, a similar issue. So just, 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 this is just to give a, um, our context as a department, how we see it and why we had incorporated it before. So I'll start with the initial um, definition uh, recommendations for the authorized entity uh, to say that um, government, uh, we don't have to categorize government, uh, all spheres, government can mean the different spheres. And also um, we don't have to distinguish NGOs because they are NGOs. So we think that as is defined NGOs, whether it's different types, they can be accommodated as long as they are NGOs. Now on the definition of audiovisual works um, and cinematograph uh, works, um, we, we, we opine as a department that the definition of audiovisual works has been drafted in a manner that includes the, the cine, cin, cinematographic works or films. So yeah, it's incorporated. And we are also, and in fact, the definition says so. It's, it, incorpor it includes it. We, we recognize the comments and we think that they are valid and, and, and absolutely correct as they are, have been stated. Um, but we also say that um, we wanted to align also to the treaty language because these are similar uh, audio, cinematograph and audiovisual is similar kind of work. So we wanted to ensure that we also align with the treaty language. And I think also from our exp experience and from reading from the uh, other um, various um, resources on, on copyright, um, 
the, the audiovisual work is becoming more and more commonly used terminology around the works. And interestingly enough, we found that in the US uh, copyright law, they refer to the audiovisual works. So we think that um, the, the way that it has been defined, we recommend that it be retained, um, taking into account the, the issues that were raised, but also the fact that um, one or the other is still applicable. But we also want to align to the uh, trends, the, 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 the global developments, and the, also the, the, the treaty implications. Okay, so the next one is around the technological protection measure definitions. Um, there were stakeholders who were of the view that the definitions of the uh, technological protection measure and the technological protection measure circumvention device, um, are, uh, they, they should be incorporated uh, in, both in both laws. I think this, um, this comment was maybe from the um, previous time it, uh, that it, they should be uh, incorporated in both legislation and that the definition of the technological protection uh, and the device uh, are not compatible with the uh, WIPO performance uh, uh, and phonogram treaties requirement um, that uh, they should provide adequate uh, legal protection. So this talks to the strength of the TPMs um, and the circumvention device, that is not is still they're still weak. They are not strong. Uh, they are not strong. So they, there is a concern about that that they are not strong enough. They should be they should be strengthened. And um, in terms of the the the, the, the definition of virtual artistic works. Um, uh, that the definition of virtual artistic works and resale royalty rights. Uh, they should be recast in a new chapter of the um, of the of the of the bill. Then the, this is a proposal that there should be a new chapter dealing with uh, um, resale royalty rights, and that the the definition that there was there were issues raised around the definition of commission. Um, one of the commentators was saying that uh, it's not the definition is not there or and it's not clear. And it only starts in the middle of the bill um, that, we, that, that the commission is not clearly uh, articulated in the bill. And also that there is a, there's a shortage in terms of the definition. There's no definition of a commission. And there was a drafting proposal that there's a line that was not, um, um, that, that there, there was a drafting uh, issue around there, that there's a line that was not underlined. Uh, and we are saying that uh, the definitions are now in both uh, bills and that um, this way, the, 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 the adequate legal protection point, we want to say to that, um, there, was a, the, the, there was extensive discussions around the, the, the strength of the TPMs and advocates spoke to that. And there are implications that we identified. Initially, we tried to strengthen them. We added, um, there were certain uh, provisions that were added around the marketing aspects to strengthen them in line with uh, other countries that have done the same. However, we also were advised by experts uh, locally, internationally, that there are other unintended, con un unintended consequences and that there are countries that are still grappling with uh, the implementation of these areas, especially with the side effects uh, around issues of competition and competition, uh, consumer protection. And over and above that, advocates spoke to some of the examples um, around how the TPMs, if you have them too strong, and they, they can also not be uh, very conducive in the developmental context. Also, also taking into account that we the rights of the rights holders, uh, the owners, copyright owners and, 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 and authors, but um, for developmental countries, this is this has this has implications. So um, hence the definitions were retained as they are, but there was extensive deliberations around them, and there was an attempt to strengthen them, and uh, it was subjected to public participation. The definition of artistic visual works and resale royalty rights uh, command is noted. Uh, and we are saying that um, we could look at the issue around the <clears throat> section 37 of the Ban Convention 
we can look at that in terms of uh, to be reviewed to see around the implications. And in terms of the definition of the commission, the commission is defined in the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act. And also there is a provision that talks to until it is, um, uh, until the law is promulgated, what should happen to the definition of commission in the interim. And this drafting suggestion about the line um, has been noted as well. Then um, there, were, uh, there were other definition points around the issues around the digital space, dig digital uh, dig digitization, that certain terminologies should be incorporated in the, in the bill, especially the CAB, looking at issues such as the data, digital, digital rights, digitization, uh, digital curation, and e-licenses. Uh, and preservation. Also that the why and wireless are not defined in the cap, uh, also for the, which are applicable for section 6A, 7A, 8A, which are royalty provisions. Um, and also recognizing that we do try to clarify it in the memorandum where we talk about internet access, but then this concept is um, challenging in terms of the ease definition. Uh, there were also proposals to define open licenses, um, uh, which are defined in the in the bill, and also that they are concerned that uh, this is not sufficiently specific about what the acts that may be undertaken are. And then the definition of open works can be extended to include works in which related rights subsists, subsists also in order to avoid a situation where copyrights can be cleared, but that related rights are still an issue. So in our response, we are saying that um, we noted the comments, but that the wording that are commonly used in aspects uh, or aspects of it um, uh, that can be found in the dictionary or that are clear do not have to be defined uh, in the legislation. Um, and some of the terms we, we found, some of the terms that were suggested are not having root in the bill itself. Um, so that can be a challenge when something is defined, but there's no specific provision talking to it. And then in terms of wire and wireless, um, which is a treaty language, um, they are also not defined in the treaty, but um, um, uh, but then used, uh, the, we, they distinguish um, platforms such as the internet or online access. So we also think that um, we don't have to bring our own definition um, around this area, given that it, it does, there is a, a common approach to it in terms of what it means, or even though it's not defined. And we were of the view that the definitions of open license and often, often works, um, they are clarified in terms of what they mean as defined. Um, definitions don't always extend to like provisions with details of what should be happening with a particular area. So we think that um, as they are defined, they are they are sufficient. Uh, Chair, the issue that Chair raised about author, because it was not related to a definition per se, but related to the provision um, of how author versus copyright owner is interpreted. Uh, we've incorporated it, I uh, think, on the slides that talks to the royalties. So it's not included on the list of the uh, definitions, but I'll talk to it when I get to that slide. Um, yeah, I'll get to that one. In terms of local organization, there were concerns raised that local organization provision in section 22, it must be withdrawn because it gives the minister arbitrary powers. And also that, um, uh, this amendment should be rejected as it is open to potential abuse and does not appear to serve any other purpose. So from our side, um, we would like to clarify that currently in the act, there are copyrights that are vested uh, for the state and international organization. And it was also opined that we should include local organization. This is copyright that is directed by or owned by these, in, um, these organizations. For instance, a local organization can commission a work that belongs to it uh, or can own a concept that is theirs in terms of the copyright and not any authors, but uh, belonging to that organization. So you can have copyright 
that is conferred to a or directed by a state organization, an international organization, or a local organization in this context. It is um, it forms part of what already is in the in the in the act. It's just that we added this local organization. So and we are of the opinion that um, as it is, it's something that can be allowed and we recommend that it be retained and that we did not see how or in which way it will infringe uh, on the rights of other copyright authors, authors or copyright owners or other creators. So the local organization, um, international organizations, state organizations do have copyright that is theirs um, and that they, they have ways of generating and that they can direct. And this is where the, the rationale is, is coming from. And then in terms of uh, 6A, 7A, 8A, these were grouped and even stakeholders raised them in that manner. So I'll also try to be a bit faster on this as well, uh, so not to take long around them, uh, but I'll still read some of the comments as they were provided so that I don't miss the context. So the first one says, the way in which the new statutory royalty entitlements under section 6A to 8A were conceptualized and hastily drafted by the National Assembly Portfolio Committee introduces so much legal uncertainty on how royalty rates could be determined, payable and shared, that it will likely not provide substantial practical benefits for the intended beneficiaries. The second one says that these sections, um, if they are to be proceeded with, the advertising industry should be excluded from their operation. Uh, also that the, these sections uh, uh, should be rejected by the Cilead Committee, or at least that the restrictive sections of the care be amended to cater for contractual freedom through the introduction of the proposed phrase, where it's relevant. And also that the fundamental difficulty with sections uh, 6A and 8 of the, of the uh, Act, and also of the 3A of the performers, um, they contemplate a single remuneration model across all forms of copyright works. I must say, um, when we were uh, in the public hearings, um, this were the one of the this, this was one of the major theme that was raised, that the bills and the we have not recognized the different types of industries that exist that um, it didn't take into account the fact that um, remuneration models differ and one size fits all model. An example of the music industry was raised that the focus was mainly on the music industry and now it's being replicated to other sectors. So um, just noting that it was one of those areas that was highly, highly ra um, raised in the, in, the, in the processes of the public hearings. In terms of the response, um, from our side as a department, um, the royalty regime in the act, uh, although it's limited currently to the sound recordings and performers, um, it, it, it's, um, that it, we were of the view that it was the intention of the act that we have the royalty provisions. If you look at the, the wording, like the royalty sharing, the, la the language that is used, the words like assignments, uh, issues around agreements. So, uh, we are of the view that these amendments are not arbitrary um, and they are necessary because the world has evolved and the bills, the bills are trying to catch up with the time lag that was lost in the processes. And um, yeah, to strengthen the existing provisions because there's no strong uh, regime or strong system for uh, royalties currently in the in the act and we need to strengthen that hence these amendments so our view is that the provision is in section 6a 7 and 8a provide the royalty regime and uh, they will provide more protection for authors and corporate owners as they aim to create an enabling environment and to create certainty of what is to be expected when there are engagements so it sets the tone and the rules of engagement so in terms of the, uh, the legislation provides a framework, but uh, 
contracting parties have the freedom to arrange how they make arrangements. So this talks to the issue around the advertising industry, uh, where they are requesting that they be excluded from the law or this uh, context of the, 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 the bills around these sections. So we are saying that um, uh, we, the, the law provides a framework, but the, the parties can have freedom to arrange how they uh, make those arrangements. Also in terms of, uh, so it's, it's their constitutional right uh, to, to, to align how they, they, they contract and make arrangements. It's not to impose on a particular industry. Uh, so it's just to note that comment. And the contractual provisions in the royalties are meant to assist authors and other rights holders with guidelines on how to approach their rights in the contracting. And uh, as, a, as one of the key recommendations from this um, comment, we are proposing that um, there should be an amendment that is effected on section 8A uh, to recognize other modes of uh, remuneration uh, the same kind of amendment that was made in the in the performance protection amendment bill, where there was a distinction between different royalties, to bring in the equitable remuneration with the royalties, so that there could be those um, options. Um, examples of remunerations was lump sum amounts that can be paid, advances um, that. Um, a sector should be given the freedom to choose how it, 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 it defines a remuneration. And we agree that it's important to do that so that the law is not too restrictive. So our proposal and recommendation is that maybe we bring in the content of uh, or the wording equitable remuneration to go with the royalties, just to create that uh, platform for other forms of uh, remuneration. Um, there were many comments on this section, so we'll try to sift them out as much as possible. So I'll come to the next public comments around this. The copyright bill um, eliminates the party's ability to contract on mutually beneficial terms uh, by uh, narrowly referring to a share of the royalty. Uh, the proposed new section 6A and 8 are accordingly so narrow and inflexible that they are unworkable. Uh, the concern is that it will be extremely difficult to implement and extremely disruptive to contracting workflows and schedules. Also that um, suggesting suggestion that section 8A be struck from the Copyright Amendment Bill um, that Section 8A should be removed and performance rights left to the regu to be left regulated to the Performance uh, Protection Act, and also that uh, it is incongruent and confusing to refer to a royalty received in the execu execution of any of the acts contemplated in Section 6. They propose that the reference to in section six to the execution of the work be deleted and that the section referred to the royalty received for the authorization of any of the acts contemplated in section six and um, eight if it is not deleted. Our response to the concerns that we raised about the link between the Copyright Amendment Bill and the performance protection, um, also about the share of royalties is that um, currently in the Copyright Act, we do have the sharing of royalties and we do have reference to agreements. So we think that uh, that content or concept is not new and also it does not mean that um, it will take away the right of the rights holders to arrange themselves in their um, respective areas. And we also say that the royalty provision should be viewed as measures to create clarity on the royalty regime and not an imposition on contractual freedom. Um, okay, so I won't repeat that. And that um, the decision to include performance in the copyright uh, was to what there was to create a link that is already there between the two um, uh, the two the two bills. Uh, I read in one of the submissions, um, a comment was about intrigue. They're intri they intricately linked. Uh, they, are, they are linked already. So it's not something that was uh, generated by this, um, by this bill, uh, the Copyright Amendment Bill. They are linked. If you look at the references, the cross-referencing between performers and performance between the two legislation. And some of the, the wording is already in the Copyright Act that talks to the 
the performances and the performance uh, related uh, provisions. And also the Copyright Act provides more, more rights and uh, what that performance need. For instance, the Copyright Tribunal uh, is in the Copyright Act, the Collecting Society model is in the Copyright Act, and these are supposed to work together. So in terms of related rights, um, they refer to the category of rights granted to performers, uh, 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 phonogram producers, that is uh, sound recording producers and broadcasters. In some countries such as the US, uh, I've noted also Canada, I think, and the United Kingdom, these rights are simply incorporated under copyright. So it's not foreign to South Africa to have this uh, in the Copyright Act. We have precedents in other countries too that have this kind of uh, models uh, where the two laws are incorporated together. Other countries such as Germany and France uh, protect these rights under the separate category called neighboring rights. So you have uh, different models. So the ones that we chose is, is in, which has been part of the legal framework is the combination of the two, or we call them the link. But um, it's not, it's a practice that is known globally. So it's not something that is um, a, anomaly for, for South Africa. And in South Africa, um, they are incorporated under copyright and, uh, and protected under uh, the, uh, both legislation. And on the uh, word execution in section 6A, um, this is just our interpretation and how we understand the provision. We are of the view that authorization is already in the provision. The execution or carrying out of certain actions refers to the actions to be taken. And as they are, the wording is sufficient. And we recommend, because we saw a few submissions recommending that there should be a separation of the two bills or the two legislation. We are recommending to the select committee that section 8A be retained um, in the copyright uh, amendment bill or as it was initially the intention of the legislation to, to have them as they are incorporated together. And the next slide, um, there was a comment about the retrospectivity that um, there's a support that the work of the creations uh, by artists, even as they have moved on with their lives from it, they should be compensated when needed retrospectively to recognize their dignity. Um, this, as, as uh, advocate was saying as well, um, the, these areas uh, have been, these provisions were removed from the bill. They were, they form part of the, uh, the, provision, the provision of, uh, of property debate around the bills and the constitutionality of retrospectivity issues of arbitrariness of the legislation. And they were, uh, the, the National Assembly Portfolio Committee uh, recognized this, this concern. So the retrospective provisions were uh, removed from the, from the Copyright Amendment Bill. In terms of um, rights of distribution and rental, uh, there was a comment made that um, 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 in terms of section six of the act, um, the distribution of on, on the original version of the work, those comments apply equally to the rental of the original version. This version is covered by the normal principle of the law relating to ownership of physical property and is not a copyright issue. So um, there was a concern about the use of the word original. It should immediately be noted that original is a technical term in copyright law, whereas it is clearly being used here in its lay sense, which is problematic. Is the issue not that it is the unauthorized disclosure of the original that is sought to be uh, prohibited? So from our understanding of this uh, concern about the, uh, um, the, 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 the original copies um, also raised by another stakeholder, uh, you, that it is not clear how factually an original published edition could be distributed. Um, this is under the distribution. So that distribution su suggests that there are multiple copies of something. So to clarify from our side is that um, on the digital rights and other exclusive rights, like rights of distribution, rights of rental, we, we took them from the treaty language or treaty implications. Uh, we do note the concern because when you look at something original, um, how does a, an original of something be, have copies at the same time? We note that concern and in the interpretation. So 
our response is that the provisions related to digital rights are derived from the international treaties. The text was used to ensure alignment with the treaties. An example is from the WIPO Copyright Treaty. If you look at the agree statement uh, concerning Article 6 and 7 um, in, those, in these articles, they're saying the expressions copies and original uh, being, uh, are being subject to the right of distribution and the right of rental under the set articles refer exclusively to fixed copies that can be put into circulation, circulation as tangible objects. So they clarify this from their, from the, the treaty perspective. And also uh, an example of the distribution, the right of distribution from Article 6 of the WCT is, is placed there to say that authors of literary and artistic works shall enjoy the exclusive right of authorizing the making available to the public of the original and copies of their works through sale of or other transfer ownership. So this is the context of where we are coming from, from those uh, rights. It's not something that we derived as a, as a department. It's informed by uh, the language in the treaties. Uh, sorry, so, TPG. Um, can, can you uh, conclude at uh, Cora to one um, is to give chance to members to ask questions for clarities? Um, and then responses, uh, because we have another meeting that uh, started too with the Department of uh, Tourism, but we want to also allow a break uh, from quarter past one uh, for members. Um, so if we can finish at uh, quarter to one, uh, so that we use the 30 minutes for questions and clarities. Uh, all right, Chair. I think what I will do then, Chair, I will try to summarize the uh, submissions uh, without going into detail. I think from the time Chair is giving me, I have uh, um, 25 minutes or so. So uh, I will talk maybe, to- Maybe if you can just uh, highlight, uh, for example, reporting uh, requirements and then the DTIC response without uh, necessarily reading the, the public comment, because okay. we, we do have uh, the presentations here. Okay. All right. I'm sorry right. to do that. Uh, no, Chase, it's noted, no problem. All right. So. All right. So in terms of the reporting requirements, the issues that we raised here overall is that the reporting requirements in the in the bills for different provisions, section 8A and 9A are cumbersome and that um, they are they they are not workable. They introduce different challenges, and also including the some of the, the 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 criminalization of them, the penalties related to them. So some stakeholders were recommending that they be removed. Um, that um, these requirements are going to be difficult to implement and to follow in terms of how they work. And uh, some were even talking about the implications for having extras in their performances. What does that look like when you now have this rig rigorous, burdensome requirement? And the fact that it's mandatory and it's got very strict um, application, even in, ter in terms of the penalties. So our response is that um, um, the non-reporting is a serious issue and it has been deliberated extensively in the National Assembly, in the Portfolio Committee. And the committee felt very strongly that it has to be strengthened and, and even they came up with those recommendations to say, let's even make it so serious that some of the actions are criminalized if certain actions do not take place. We note the fact that they are very strict uh, requirements, but then this was um, part of those deliberations. But over and above that, the point is to say that there has been issues with royalty payments. I'm going to read an expert, uh, an extract from the Copyright Review Commission that found that uh, music use, usage information, music, uh, log sheets um, are kept mainly by broadcasters and that general music users tend not to retain any log sheets. Uh, so collecting societies are therefore not able to accurately distribute royalties. So this is the point. Without these reporting requirements, without the reporting, it's difficult for payments of royalties. It's difficult for um, the, 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 the the performers to get their rightful um, uh, royalties or remuneration. So it's one of those policy issues that was extensively, extensively debated and it, it has those implications. And then in terms of the fair use uh, provision, uh, this one, I one will not go into too much detail around it because um, many stakeholders are aware of concerns around fair use. 
um, the, the overarching issue here was that uh, some were saying that the hybrid model, this linking of fair use and, and fair dealing at the same time, and the list of exceptions, is, it looks like something that South Africa is innovating. It's not something that is um, um, in line with international uh, best practices. Uh, and that um, this opening up of fair use, uh, that is an, a US um, a regime, is gonna, it's not gonna work in the South African context and it's gonna open us up to different challenges, some of them related to constitutionality, uh, arbitrariness, the deprivation of property and so on. So, um, and there were stakeholders who wanted that certain things must be added to, the certain uses must be added, especially around um, uses, around computational analysis, so I'll just talk to them the, the way forward. So in terms of the fair dealing, fair use, the hybrid model, um, globally, um, South Africa is not the only country that is using the list of exceptions with the general fair use exception. Many countries, even those that are, are known as the Commonwealth countries where they use fair dealing as a regime, they're starting to open up more and they've got more uh, wider exceptions um, that are um, similar to what we have in the legislation. So hence many countries, some of them actually praise the country for having this kind of uh, exceptions because they're not unique to us. Uh, and, and even those that are, so this um, hybrid or model of both fair use and fair dealing is something that is a, a, a common trend now. Uh, even for those countries with fair dealing, they still have exceptions that are open and that are taking into account the digital space, uh, taking into account the developmental areas of the country. And they are more developmental. I think Advocate spoke uh, very well on it in terms of her and her, how she sees it. And it's, it's actually the same kind of thinking that we have. So we think that the current exceptions as they are, uh, whether we call it hybrid or the list of exceptions with fair use, we think that they are sufficient as they are. There was an issue around the public administration um, purpose that was added to say it should not be there. And we have the view that um, um, this is a, a, one of the purposes and that um, with the four factor test that is included, it can be measured in terms of how the public administration purpose is applied, which talks to the works by the uh, public, uh, public administration. Uh, in terms of the scholarship issue, uh, there was an issue raised about the scholarship purpose that is gonna create certain challenges in the economy uh, for, the, for the authors and the owners. And we have the view that this was debated extensively and it was um, in the National Assembly decided that we should retain it because of the fact that it was giving a better context on the purpose in terms of these areas, especially the concern about education. And um, the, 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 um, the computational analysis issue we, we, we noted the, the, the various stakeholders raised the fact that it should be included in the, in the bill um, in the fair, under the uses of fair use. Our, our view is that many stakeholders actually compared the US uh, fair use with the South African fair use and they listed the purposes that our, ours are extensive. They go far beyond what the US law has provided. And even though we model, they say we model ourselves with them, we've exceeded them, we are even wider. And so our view is that we, we would like to also not, uh, just to note that concern and to also say that with the, such as, as part of the uh, provision, such as provides that, um, and you don't have to have an ex exhaustive list of uh, exceptions or purposes listed. Uh, it's future proof, meaning that they can be interpreted into the law. So we think that for now, the uh, recommendation not is, to, is not to add so that also we accommodate the fact that our the list is already seen as ex extremely uh, elaborate and noting that it is an important area as well. The same applies to the right of repair. There was a concern raised that there should be a right of repair uh, that is added in, as part of the, uh, the purposes. Some stakeholders suggested that such as be removed from the, from the bill, uh, given challenges with such as, and that uh, South Africa is not, it, it does not have enough juris, we, have, we don't have experience when it comes to jurisprudence, when it comes to the fair use provisions. And then on the on the substitution effect, um, there were concerns raised about that to say the substitution effect has a has an implication of creating 
um, other copyright works that may maybe compete with the the works of the of the copyright owners and the, the authors and that um, by having the word cost substitution effect it has got um, it, it's creating a, 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 a precedent that um, the copyright works can be exploited in a way that was not intended so um, the suggestion was that it should be removed in total as it is. But then our um, suggestion on it is that maybe we don't remove it completely, but maybe we tone it, we remove, we look at it from the, maybe the example of the US where they talk about the effect of the use upon the potential market uh, for or, or, or value of the copyrighted work. So that doesn't look like the work is derived or is, is substituted for another one. So we can maybe look at the word substitution as a potential word that can be removed from the from the bill. So we are recommending that maybe this um, proposal on substitution, there should be that review of the provision or sub clause to maybe look at re removing substitution and maybe having it look similar to the one that is in the United States around the substitution effect, about the, the effect of the, the usage in the market, not the substitution effect itself. And there is some um, jurisprudence around that in the US around the cases that had something to do with this substitution effect. But in terms of the jurisprudence in South Africa, as advocate has indicated, there are cases that have been um, dealt with in terms of fair dealing. So there is a experience in terms of our judiciary around the areas of uh, fair, fair dealing. So yeah, so this is not something completely new where they won't be, they won't know where to start around it. So. The major area here, I won't read the comments around the impact assessments. Um, there has been a lot of concerns that the department has not done a regulatory impact assessment. I think in terms of different comments, this is the major issue that has been raised, raised and that the socioeconomic impact assessment is not the one that we have done, is not sufficient. Um, and that we have not done one for fair use, for the exceptions, and um, in terms of our response to this is that the, the, the bill have evolved significantly um, and with the different changes and the amendments. So the thinking is that at different stages where changes were made, it would not have been very practical to do a new uh, regulatory impact assessment. But just to clarify the context, the, the socioeconomic impact assessment was done and it's a, it's a mandate of the presidency. It was not done by the department. So it was, it's the mandate of the department of the, and, and also the socioeconomic impact, it's a new requirement. It's a requirement since 2015 uh, for the legislation. And also we did do a regulatory study that many have critiqued in terms of its, uh, its value, in terms of uh, addressing of the issues. So to recommend on this impact assessment uh, issue that has affected the way the bill is perceived across the board and the perception of the quality of the provisions, it is recommended that the select committee can where possible, initiate a process of an independent regulatory impact study to address the concerns of the public, including on fair use and exceptions. Um, just as, a, as an opinion on this is that we have the view the the study may not be widely accepted because different diverse groups, uh, stakeholders in the copyright-based industries have got different objectives. And there are many experts as well. So chances are, even if one expert is selected, they may it, the person might, might not be accepted by the other stakeholders. So this process might have its own challenges in terms of the validity and ac wide acceptance across the board. But this is just from our own experience. Uh, but we think that maybe this might be a possible way forward as well in terms of that clarifying because the copies that we have provided are not seen as sufficient but this is a presidency process as well in terms of those uh, CSs and including the regulatory study we did and the other work that we have done as well over the years, like the Copyright Review Commission report that was done by the department. On the 25 years reversion right, um, various stakeholders raised issues around this um, uh, right. The concern was that um, the number of years, that 25 years is not enough, uh, that it should be longer and that, um, 
the the other implications around reversion. For example, what if you can't find the author in the, in 25 years? What if there's a production taking place in 25 years and now it must revert back? What happens to that uh, production or that work that has been developed over the years? Um, so there were implications. What if there are more than one authors involved, and 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 what do what what does that mean? Like the implications. So the the concerns around it have been um, uh, noted, and we've seen that it, is, it was one of the areas that was discussed extensively, even in the in the public hearings. Our 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 response around reversion is that um, we the the revision period was um, was was recommended or informed by the Copyright Review Commission. And our ours is 25 years. In the US, it's, it's 35 years. And our view is that is because uh, their uh, term of copyright is longer. Ours is 50 years. It's it's, it's after, after the death of a, an author. It's 50, it's 50 years. In the US, is 70 years. And then in terms of the the the, the this was informed as indicated. And we think that. Um, Maybe in terms of the other intricacies around it, they can be addressed in the regulations. The other issues that needs to be clarified on how it's, it's really going to work in the South African context. And also we are of the view that there is also scope for uh, parties to renegotiate their agreements. So that, that freedom of uh, contracting still there, there could be negotiations or renegotiations or contracting again. So the content day from the Copyright Review Commission was just to indicate that this was one of the recommendations or some of the areas that were identified in the Review Commission report that was, uh, uh, that was uh, commissioned by the department with commissioners to look at that recommended the 25 years because they have the view that it's enough time for the investment to be recou recouped. And yeah, so this is the context that's of where it, it is coming from. On the compulsory standard contractual terms, um, the concerns here were that um, these are unfair. Uh, it gives powers to the minister, including for the royalty clauses, uh, that um, uh, this is not supposed to be the case. This should be freedom of contracting should be allowed between private parties. And then there were concerns raised about the unenforceable contracts. Uh, provision that it should be removed from the bill. Um, why should we have something, a, a, a provision of that nature, um, that these powers should not be given to the minister to, 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 to even in the bill, like, like the unenforceable contract. So the recommendation to have the standard comp templates of contracts also comes from the uh, Copyright Review Commission. It said that the department should develop a standardized template for contracts between performers and recording companies. And over the years, and even with research and consultations and engagements with industry, we have found that although the recommendation was focusing on the music industry, it is relevant for other industries as well. Um, in, because of uh, industry practices um, uh, and some of the findings from studies and also unfair contractual issues, we found that it is necessary for the templates or the guidelines we provided, not just for the music industry, because there has been an argument or debate that the model of a music industry has informed the entire, the entire bill, the Copyright Amendment Bill. So as indicated, this is meant to protect and create an enabling environment. And we also say that the provisions of the, and on the unenforceable contracts are, are aimed at ensuring adherence to the act, um, where the rights provided in the act are violated uh, and where the contracts become unenforceable. So it is an additional protection. Um, so this, um, and we also see the role of the tribunal is very important because the tribunal um, can uh, intervene in, in, in these disputes of contracts. And there are countries that also regulate contractual arrangements. This is not unique to South Africa. Um, I think an example is the Germany uh, Copyright Act that has got provisions that talks about contracting. So governments do intervene when there are market failures or there are market issues or there are concerns in the market uh, where there's a need to intervene or support or, pro or protect and then in terms of the compulsory, uh, furthermore, there was a recommendation around the recent royalty rights uh, that there should not be uh, a rate for all uses of uh, 
uh, royalty rates, but then it should only be confined to the resale royalty rights. And um, we are of the view that uh, that comment can be accommodated uh, from the uh, policy point of view. So we are recommending that the <clears throat> provision in section 39 CEL uh, can be refocused and focus only on the resale royalty rights. And in terms of the other rates, contractual freedom can be allowed where con um, parties can agree on the rates and how they contract without the intervention of government. So it's just a recommendation based on the views that were shared by the <clears throat> by the stakeholders, some of where, where it was raised. Um, and then in terms of the commission works, they were concerned about the commission works that um, this must be um, looked at. Some stakeholders provided drafting suggest suggestions uh, around it. Um, so these are the works that are commissioned, uh, for example, in photography, in arts, um, broadcasting works. Um, so in terms of the, the issues here was that we, we noted that there were challenges that arose from the commission works where the rights of the authors were, um, were, were hindered. For instance, where the, uh, the, the, there was work commission, but the work was used for other purposes or the work was not used uh, at all, it remained dormant. Um, so there are certain uh, protections that were added or provisions that also gives uh, the role of the tribunal and the authors in the in this commission works where you commission a work and the role of a contractual arrangement between the parties. So this was meant to just strengthen the, the act um, and to address those challenges. And in section 12B, um, there were certain proposals that were so sorry, so from 12 uh, B uh, exceptions 12B to 12D, uh, there were certain recommendations made. Um, I think one of the key ones was that in the temporary copies that are used for um, in 12C, that um, consideration should be given to removing the, the adaptation, the adaptation of the works. And um, although we are of the view that it should be temporary copies and adaptations, it's an area that we can we 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 thought we can look at uh, maybe in terms of what has what are the other best practices around it. We 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 thought it's one of the areas that we can also look into as well. Uh, part of the recommendation was that that adaptation part can be more applicable in one area, maybe in the. Uh, personal use um, provisions than in the uh, temporary uh, copies and adopt, uh, in that in that uh, technical area of the bill. So it's something that we think it can be uh, dealt with. Another issue was around the uh, 12B subsection six that till, that deals with uh, uh, parallel importation. This provision we adopted the international exhaustion international exhaustion because of the implications uh, internationally and um, ensuring that we deal with issues of uh, ensuring this, um, the, 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 the challenge of the pricing of books is addressed, there's access to more materials and there could be a flow in terms of how uh, these are, are dealt with from, the, uh, uh, from the, 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 the authors in the country and the, cop the copyright owners and then the others in the, and how they then trade with the other, uh, other countries. But then there were concerns raised that uh, the legislation cannot talk to what happens outside the Republic. So we are of the view that because there's already a provision uh, in section 23, subsection two that talks to it, uh, we can maybe look at the two, uh, just a review uh, of 12B, subsection six and 23, two, just to see um, how these two can be maybe um, simplified or streamlined for the purposes of uh, improving the bill. So it's one area that we've also noted for potential um, uh, consideration. And in the freedom of panorama, it's just a clarification because uh, one comment was saying this section must be, it's not even properly repealed. And just to indicate that there was a substitution. Uh, so there was no need to take the provision and, and, and repeal it. There are stakeholders who have appreciated this uh, provision to say it's going to assist in terms of how the public works, uh, um, works of art that are in public domain can be applied from a copyright point of view without them becoming infringements. So it's one of those that have been um, supported. So in terms of the uh, section on the libraries, uh, museums and archives, there were not many comments made. 
Um, so we recommended that, uh, for example, there was a recommendation about the downloading of some works in 19C. And our view is that for now, we, should, we can't uh, make that uh, provision in the legislation, given the, already the concerns that are raised about the way the exceptions are wide. So it's something that we think we should not maybe uh, look into for now. And then there was a comment that there should be a government regime looking at um, similar to one in 19D to look at uh, libraries. And we think that is not applicable for, for them. Um, and certain wording for technology was suggested for the uh, for, for, for 19C. And we think that the issues of technology has been, has been embedded in the section. Um, for example, issues like digital are there, words like digital are there, format shifting are there. So I think even though it's not the same wording proposed, technology has been factored in, in those. For 19D, um, we, we think we, we, we align with the uh, comments that were made around ensuring that there's a, the constitutional uh, judgment is taken into consideration, but then also noting that what we already have in the bill, we have we are of the view addresses the constitution and some of the technical amendments that are required for the to align with the judgment, especially where there are limitations for the for this section. We note them and we think that they, they should be supported. For example, uh, uh, the section uh, 28P on the uh, permitted uses that are, are linked to the where you can um, a, 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 a technological protective measure can be circumvented. We think that should not hinder accessible format copies. So we think that to delete that should be taken into account to ensure that there's no restrictions for persons uh, for this uh, for this section. And um, where there's referencing issues, like for example, where sex subsection one uh, is refer referenced in the 19 uh, subsection 19D3, we think that we can also support that amendment. The issue of the prescribed um, and is something that maybe we can look at with the uh, parliamentary team with their expertise is that we were of the view that because we are talking about an authorized an authorized entity, when you say authorized, it's something that must be. Um, meaning there should be some kind of an intervention or some kind of a, some kind of a uh, process. So hence the the word prescribed. We understand that with the judgment, um, the the judgment make that section thirteen a effective immediately. But then we had a prescribed already in the in the bill, and um, some stakeholders were suggesting that we remove it. But it's an area that we can uh, touch base on with the colleagues to look at it again uh, in terms of the word prescribed because we think that it should be retained uh, because we looked at it from the perspective of the current, uh, there's a current process that has unfolded with the with the constitutional court judgment, but then the bill itself in terms of what an authorized, when you say you authorize, authorized entity and so on, but we'll come to that with the further deliberations around that. And on often works, stakeholders were raising the fact that it's cumbersome. There are lots of issues there, um, issues around licensing, the role of the, the, the commission. And um, our view is that as it is, um, it's supposed to be there. Of course, there may be other areas that look like they're very extensive, but we have found an example in the UK law that is as extensive talking to licensing and the uh, roles of regular agencies. So the sections 116A to 116D of the UK law has a similar kind of uh, framework. Um, and we think that for now it can be looked at, it can, be, it can be retained. Maybe for the resale royalty rights, the comment around that to say, should it apply to resale royalty rights where you, um, whenever there's a resale of an original at, at a, the uh, implications. So maybe it's an area that we can maybe review. So we, we, we can look at that, but the rest of it, uh, we think that it should be retained. And on the penalties and sanctions, um, the, whole, the, the, the different issues that were raised, some of them were around the reporting uh, registrations that so they are too uh, extensive and they are too strong. There were comments made that on the uh, civil penalties related to the technical protection measures, uh, they should be not criminal kind of um, penalties, but they should be civil penalties. So we we are of the view that um, we need, okay, internationally we have been found that our legislation does not cater for um, overall, it does not cater for um, 
infringements in terms of the uh, piracy online uh, issues and so on. And um, the concern has been that we have a weaker um, enforcement in terms of intellectual property. So we are of the view that some of those, uh, like the provision where we are talking about the criminalization of uh, when you distribute, uh, making available the works to the public by commercial or non-commercial purposes, uh, those should be seen in a serious light, that if that happens, it does have an implication for the copyright owner, for the author. So it's, it's an area that we can also review um, for further consideration, but we think that we need a strong uh, intellectual property enforcement regime and uh, that deters certain uh, behaviors in the market. So in terms of the drafting suggestions, they, we, uh, for example, on uh, which they know, or they, were, they ought to have known in section 27, subsection 5C, we think that they can be reviewed as well. Uh, uh, advocates spoke to the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act, its implications, I'm not gonna talk to that. And there were other amendments that talked to uh, the, the days of days of consultations that they should be 60 days instead of 30 days. There should be more um, cyber crime related provisions included. Um, intellect, um, artificial intelligence, um, uh, it should be clarified that an intelli artificial intelligence does not have um, access, should, cannot have copyright uh, conferred to it as an author and issues around the reciprocity. Uh, so here's just clarifying why we think that the provision for the collecting society to have relationships with others in other countries, we think that they can work. So most of the inputs in this slide is just to clarify uh, what is possible uh, and, and what we cannot do at this stage, given that some of the issues have not been tested, for example, on the artificial intelligence. Um, and so on. And uh, other issues around the, the powers of the tribunal. Uh, we're not making any recommendations around that, but to clarify that we have the view that the tribunals can impose fines, um, they can make orders, um, they can also uh, fine in terms of turnovers to the juristic persons. Um, and that uh, currently we have a, a tribunal with limited uh, jurisdictions and that the powers, if they are given to the tribunal, they will be in line with the legislation, the relevant legislation. I think in this, one of the comments was talking about the Superior Courts Act, that it must be in aligned, alignment with that. And um, yeah, so the other works like uh, more prohibitions uh, for infringements, um, we think that some of those, uh, um, uh, we, we, yeah, like the injunctions and, and so on, we think that some of those uh, for now, um, like uh, the, the, the legal system of the US, how they deal with uh, fair use uh, violations or so on, you know, the, those examples. Um, so we're not making any recommendations except on the drafting suggestions that were made around the semicolon in one of these, uh, in, 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 in 9A is something that can be looked at. And um, I'm gonna quickly move to the performers because I know now I've moved outside the timelines that the chair has given me, okay. Just quickly for the performance protection chair, um, the issues were raised that were raised were similar to the ones in the copyright, especially around the reversion and definitions around the broadcast, the performer, producer. Then there was one I'll note around the extras. This is not this. I I agree with the with advocate Van der Melfe on the extras that we don't need to define extras. Uh, in the industry, they know the distinction between extras and um, other performers. There's no royalty that goes to an extra. Per, extra. The, even the treaty does not distinguish an extra. However, uh, this is just for consideration um, to, to maybe just to check if maybe we can maybe take the suggested drafting into account. In our view, it is not really necessary because what we have is already sufficient. But just as a consideration, this is one of the areas, there was a drafting suggestion provided. Maybe we can look into that. And, and in others, we're more saying we must delete certain provisions that we are mixing rights, like remuneration rights and exclusive rights. And, uh, but our view is that we follow the format of the act, the structure of the act. And we think that as they are now, um, they can be retained as they are, uh, some of these areas. And there was one comment where it was suggesting rejection of different provisions, but it was not clear in terms of in terms of the the why. But we 
we were, we're not recommending anything to be to be changed mainly in the performance. I think the only area is the extras that we think it can be given um, it can be given consideration. Chair, I will stop there and to thank uh, the honourable members uh, for the opportunity for the department to respond to the public submissions and to thank the public and the experts and everyone who contributed to this process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Um, let, let me just go back to advocate uh, before we, we allow members uh, to, to, to ask questions for clarities. Um, we, we received the report, uh, I mean, the presentation yesterday, so it was uh, difficult to make comparison uh, on what uh, was presented uh, by uh, advocate uh, whether it find expression in the input uh, of the department. So I will then uh, revert back to uh, Advocate Twandemeva to, to check, to confirm if uh, uh, the, the issues that he highlighted in, in her uh, input have been addressed. Uh, for example, the issues that are highlighted in slide 19 of your, of your report, Advocate, uh, and also slide 21, uh, 21 deals with the royalties, the uh, author. Uh, there were issues of uh, a policy that you referred to with regard to uh, the fair use, the, the hybrid. Uh, uh, and also there are a lot of uh, uh, amendments that were made uh, with regard to, to, to section 19, slide 28, as well as 29, as well as other slides. Uh, I just wanted first uh, your confirmation with regard to that, and then we, after that, we allow members to ask questions, uh, but also respond to some of the issues that are referred to the committee uh, in terms of the proposals. Advocate, thank you. Can you ask that uh, the slides, say, uh, I mean, the presentation be removed from the screen? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Yes, uh, um, in one way or another, all those questions that are raised that are policy issues have been addressed. For, for instance, the proposal of Section 8A should stay part of the bill, of the Copyright Amendment Bill, but we can bring in the same terminology as in the performance protection. Fair use, the proposal is that we remain with fair use, but a hybrid, so there are specific exceptions. So I think most of these things have, oh, in fact, all of these things have been addressed in respect of slides specifically um, that you mentioned uh, 19, sections 5, 2 and 21, 2, they spoke to the localized organizations and why it is necessary to make provision for localized organizations. And then on blind is a, um, I think that we, 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 are, we are more or less the same um, on, on the same page there, except for authorized entity, um, I might not understand it correctly, but um, when I discussed with the department, I understood that authorized entity was one um, a possibility, who a possible person who could make accessible format copies as defined, mm -hmm. and then that there could be another um, entity that would be prescribed. So that is perhaps just something the department can highlight a bit better. Um, maybe just also to respond on dramatic works in your question, Chair. Dramatic works might be new to the to the bill, but it is already in the act. So it is not a new term totally, um, but we'll have to just see when we when we put it in the bill, if there are some sections that need to maybe be changed to make provision for the changed content. So, so that is that is there. Um, um, the, 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 the other thing maybe that, that I just want to, to uh, point out on, on the socioeconomic impact assessment that was proposed um, by the department for the committee to do, I, I don't agree that the committee is the correct entity. To, to look at that. It is not a parliamentary function. Um, a socioeconomic impact assessment is a cabinet requirement, um, and that requirement is to see whether the bill should in fact receive cabinet approval. I am aware that the bill did undergo such a process and that it subsequently received uh, cabinet approval, or that is how I understood it from what the department has been presenting so far. If the department is concerned about the impact of the bill as it is currently, that would be for the department then to, to halt the bill. The minister can't withdraw the bill anymore. The bill has passed its second reading twice now. Um, but it would be for the department to maybe ask for it to be halted so that they can do that. If the department, however, is satisfied that the bill will achieve 
what they wanted to achieve, in other words, that the impact that it will have is the correct impact, then the department must simply say that to this committee. This is what we believe the bill would achieve. We, are, we have faith in this bill, and then we proceed on that basis. Because how parliament looks at the impact is by public consultation, and that has happened now. The committee has considered the concerns raised by, by some members of the public, the, um, whether against the bill or whether the delay of the bill. Um, and I think they were, were both sides were represented and the committee can consider that um, in respect of the impact. But otherwise, a, an actual impact assessment, in my view, would be for the department to, to look at if, if they are of the view that it is necessary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for so much, uh, Advocate Fanamep. Uh, I think you've addressed the uh, uh, proposal to the uh, to the committee uh, very well. Uh, I'll check with Ms. Uh, uh, Samara Ali if uh, there are anything that you pick up from the presentation of the department. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, with regards to the impact assessment, it was one of the issues that I had identified. Um, I do concur with my colleague that it's not a recommendation for the committee to consider. It should be done by the department. Um, and at this stage, it really doesn't make logical sense to carry out a, an impact assessment, considering that the bill is in the second House of Parliament to be finalized. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Samara Ali. Uh, Honourable members, uh, I've been uh, corrected. Uh, uh, I've been away. I'm told that uh, we meet in the Department of Tourism uh, at uh, half past two. So that's why I had to allow uh, uh, Dr. Masos to carry on beyond the quarter two, uh, um, the one, uh, because I've been corrected with regard to time. I see your hand, DDG, you want to come in? Um, th th thank you, um, Chairperson. In terms of the um, the issue of the, I just wanted to clarify two things. Um, on the Section 19D, the issue of prescribed, I, I agree with the advocate. I noticed that it's an area where we 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 kind of said different things a little bit. And I propose that, uh, Chair, we maybe come back with that one. I don't want to have a to and fro in the platform on that. So if it's if it's possible, uh, because they, there's a proposed amendments that uh, I, I understand has been circulated to the to to the com to the committee that we be allowed maybe to engage about it um, in terms of what we are what we mean. Um, from our understanding, there are those that could be prescribed uh, while we recognize that they, they are authorized entities, but maybe they, when we engage further, then we come back. It will be something that I, we can do in a better way than in this platform. And then on the impact assessment, I must clarify, remember we are responding to the public and an overwhelming amount of them have raised a concern about the socioeconomic impact assessment. So by recommending it, I was not saying that the committee must draft it themselves or um, outsource it themselves, but even if it's a decision. The thing about the bills was that even in the previous process, we were of the view that we have done sufficient work, we've done sufficient research, we have consulted sufficiently. They were returned to parliament because of that. So we think that from the department side, it's sufficient, the work was sufficient, the consultation was sufficient. However, given the overwhelming concern raised by different submissions around this, I thought I should bring it to the attention of the committee and the chairperson to guide on that. Because um, I'm just foreseeing possibly there might be a challenge in future of the same kind of issue where uh, when it's referred, if it goes that to that level, when it's referred, there could be that issue that there was no impact assessment, there was no this, there was especially around the fair use, and so it's not to give more work to the to to the parliamentary process, but just to acknowledge that there was that um, overwhelming concern raised. So uh, our position is that the bills, as they stand, they 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 pass constitutional master. The bills, as they stand, are sufficient they can be passed as they are. Um, however, we also need to take into account concerns that are being raised. That's where we are coming from. We think that uh, enough work was done, enough studies were done. Hence, in the different slides, I was showing what different uh, researchers were saying, especially the Copyright Review Commission, where possible, 
and indicating that even our own regulatory impact referred to fair use and recommendations. So we acknowledge that a lot has been done, but I didn't want to miss an opportunity to take into account the concerns that we raised. So it's something that the how of it is something else, but it's a big issue. And after the bills are passed, it might be one of those that is also raised further out there. So I, we don't have a position around that, Chairperson. And I just wanted to bring that just to clarify. We think that as they are, they're fine, but we need to take into account concerns when they're being raised. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think let's leave it at that. If a Parliament passes the, the two bills, uh, then you, you'll monitor uh, from the department side in terms of uh, its implementation. Uh, but then if, if you feel uh, uh, that uh, there are, again, uh, amendments that are required, and then we'll follow the same process, uh, that of uh, uh, impact, uh, uh, economic, social eco economic impact assessment, and then uh, we, we take it uh, uh, from there, and then you introduce the bill uh, to parliament after you have followed all the other processes, cabinet and uh, uh, I don't know if it's been to netlock uh, as well, uh, the, the bill. Um, yeah, I think let's leave it at that for now. Uh, it will be up to Parliament if it passes the bill, and also it will be up to you to monitor its implementation and perhaps some uh, uh, unforeseen uh, uh, challenges. Uh, but uh, we, we, as members, I'm sure we uh, are satisfied that uh, both you and Advocate Fanameve uh, and uh, uh, Shamira Ali have uh, assured us that uh, with regard to uh, the constitutionality uh, of, of the two bills, um, you don't foresee a uh, court uh, de uh, I mean, uh, declaring uh, these bills unconstitutional. So let, let's leave it at that. Um, le let's now allow members then to ask questions for clarity. And then after that, we'll deal with the way forward. Any hands? Please assist me, uh, Ms. Madia. There are any hands? Um, I don't see any hands at present, Chair. Oh, okay. So maybe then it's a, it's a clear, uh, but also members have the opportunity as well to 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 go back to the documents uh, that we have been given, uh, the presentation by Advocate Fanameva, the presentation by the department. Uh, I'm told that in terms of the program, uh, next week we'll be considering the report. I want to suggest that uh, perhaps the team, because uh, there are some proposals uh, also from the department itself, uh, it is proposing to review some uh, 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 sections or provisions, uh, but also the, some deletion that it is uh, proposing. Uh, uh, I want to suggest that uh, perhaps the team uh, together with DTIC uh, then compile a, 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 a report that takes into account some of the propo new proposals and deletions and then that, that uh, report then will be tabled for consideration uh, by the committee uh, on the 25th, next, next Tuesday. Um, if we agree on that, I don't know if, uh, if that is clear. Because what, what, we, what, what we, we, we agreed uh, when at, at the start of uh, uh, the, the this the meeting that we are considering the two bills is that because there are section seventy six bills, um, it's up to the provinces to to decide on these issues. But also we have this process that we are required uh, to follow by the constitution that of having uh, public uh, hearings and uh, and responses mm. to, uh, to, uh, to the submissions that are made by the presenters. But we agree that uh, we will then compile a report and they send it to all the provinces so that as they prepare for the negotiating mandates, also they take into account uh, the work that we, uh, we have been doing uh, in the select committee. Uh, so that's why then for the uh, uh, next week, we should be done with the NCOP process uh, so that we send the reports to 
the provinces uh, uh, to consider uh, the, the, the work that uh, we have been doing. Um, uh, when they submit the, the, the uh, uh, negotiating mandates. And then after this negotiating mandate, we will uh, see what uh, the provinces are proposing and also take into account uh, the, the report uh, that we would also send to the, to, the, to the provinces with regard to uh, the amendments. I don't know if Honorable Tango if, uh, had the... No, I just wanted to say we agree, Chairperson, except that we need to look at the timing of when we take it to the provinces. Because at um, sometimes I, I'm looking at the transport bill, uh, the clash between our own program and their programs uh, needs to be harmonized because at times we will not be able to attend their meetings to brief them. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's why by next week, uh, on the 25th, we, we should be done with our own processes as a NCOP uh, and, and then wait for the negotiating mandates uh, and engage those negotiating mandates and, uh, and also the this, uh, wait for the final mandates from the provinces um, after we have uh, sent them the report on the negotiating mandates. Um, I've been informed that uh, the, the meeting on negotiating mandates will be in person in Parliament. Um, maybe uh, Ms. Matea can indicate the dates for us. Um, yes, thank you, Chairperson. Three, in terms of the legislative program, um, the negotiating mandates is taking place on the 16th of May in, in person at Parliament. Um, the venue that we have is um, M515 um, for Floor Moss building. Um, however, that venue is also subject to change. And then we have final mandates on the 23rd of May, um, also physical meeting at Parliamentary. Thank you so much. Um, before we close uh, this part of the meeting, uh, can I just check if there are any comments uh, uh, from the department from uh, uh, the CLCO and uh, it's, uh, Samara uh, Ali. Chair, from my side, there's nothing. Thank you very much to you and to the members for, for listening to me. I also went yeah. a bit over time, but thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much. Uh, I've heard that you won't be part of us next week. I don't know if there are any changes. No, I will, I will not be attending the meeting next week, but I am already working through the report that I've received now and I've made some, some inputs. I will send it to, hopefully I can send it um, to Maria by the end of the day. And then I will also look at the responses um, and um, I, will make, I will make inputs on that. So there will be uh, some, something, something about me will be at the meeting, but it might just not be in person. So, okay. Yeah, thank you, Chief. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, DDG? Chairperson, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity for the department to respond to the public. Uh, I don't have any additional comments. We will look forward to the next processes. Thank you. Okay. Samara? Thank you, Chair. I'm covered. Okay, covered. I don't know if uh, honorable members like to make comments. If not, uh, let me take this opportunity uh, to thank all the presenters, the uh, advocate for assisting us, giving direction, and also the responses um, to the uh, submissions uh, that were uh, made by the presenters. Uh, it was also very interesting that there were a lot of uh, submissions uh, on the issue of definitions, uh, which is a uh, uh, not usual. Uh, not most of the time, uh, a presenter will go into uh, other sections uh, rather than uh, section one, which deals with the uh, uh, definition. Uh, so it shows a lot, a lot of interest uh, on the two bills uh, uh, that we are dealing with. Thank you very much, uh, uh, honorable members. We will now close um, our agenda and uh, meet again at uh, half past two to consider the annual performance plan of uh, the Department of Tourism and uh, its NDT, the South African Tourism. 
Uh, for now, thank you very much. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Um, I think we'll log out and then log in at uh, half past two. Or we start with the meeting at half past two. We should log in earlier than half past two. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for attending. Recording the stopped.